2023 is over. 2024, the most important year so far in human history is here. We're at the crossroads right now. That's the fire of liberty. Humanity's desire for freedom against the Great Reset, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, and the World Order. And I believe in the fire of humanity. I bet on you. I bet on humanity being a space-faring nation, a space-faring world, and setting up Humanity 2.0, what Elon Musk is talking about. We can do this together. We have a vision to challenge the globalists and their dystopic depopulation agenda. We can break the back of the New World Order. We have to build our own vision. I'll see you on the other side in 2024. The fire of liberty or humanity or whatever it is doesn't burn at all here on YouTube. If you want liberty, you'll have to go elsewhere. This channel sustained a community guideline strike immediately following my previous broadcast, which is fine since YouTube doesn't pay me anyway, but the strike wasn't for the Alex Jones video. It was for a video I made well over a year and a half ago. They claimed I was engaging in hate speech. Want to take a wild guess to whom this so-called hate speech was directed? The whole thing was nothing more than a joke I told about Disney. Look, folks, I've always hated Disney since before it was political and cool to do so. You can't force me to like Disney any more than you can convince me this trial isn't a sham. The really stupid part about this is the clip they removed comes from a longer video that they didn't even notice. So I will have to delete it myself. That makes a total of four videos gone, I believe. So when all these videos are gone, don't forget that they are all still available on these other two websites that I won't dare mention out loud. I'm also active on Twitter, now that free speech is allowed there. So give me a follow. If you let me know you came over from here, I'll follow you back. Okay, sorry for all my bitching. On with the show trial. So here we are, day one of the Texas trial. This took place on July 29th of 2022. And here we see Lil Mark Bankston gloating at Jones as he enters the courtroom. That's his little way of letting us know just how fair this trial is. It's not personal in any way, of course. Wait, what the? Why the hell is Mike from Red Letter Media wearing a wig and pretending to be a judge? I'm confused. This is going to be one hell of a trial, man. And I'm going to officially call the case. This is cause number D1GN18001835, Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis versus Alex E. Jones and Free Speech Systems, LLC. Could I have announcements for the plaintiff, please? And if Mr. Bankston, you'll just announce everybody, please. Sure, Your Honor, Mark Bankston for the plaintiffs, along with Wesley Ball, Kyle Farah, and William Ogden. And your clients are with you today? Oh, yes, Your Honor, announcement also is my clients, Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis. All right, Mr. Reynal. And Dino Reynal for defendant Alex Jones, with me in the courtroom, Joe Magliolo, West Medlin. And you also represent Free Speech Systems, don't you? I do, Your Honor. All right. Okay, and I know you'll make those introductions again when the jury comes out. That's fine. This is just for the record here today. Um, we previously had a discussion off the record, myself, Mr. Bankston, and Mr. Reynal, regarding um, an opening statement by the court to the jury just to lay the land a little bit for them. I'm not going to read it now because I'm going to read it in a minute, but I want to put on the record that you're in agreement with this statement, Mr. Bankston. No objection, Your Honor. And Mr. Reynal. Subject to our prior objection regarding bifurcation, we agree to the court's language. I'd also, before the jury comes in, like to raise um, the additional uh, issue, which is we've objected to the introduction of evidence that isn't relevant to actual damages. And so I would ask the court, so as I, not to interrupt Mr. Bankston, to give me a running objection during his opening when he's discussing evidence uh, that goes to the amount of punitive damages rather than the amount of actual damages like mouse. Right, so your objection is overruled. You may have a running objection. The only evidence that we are reserving is net worth. Thank you. 
All right. Are we ready then? All right. Yeah. 459 District Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Maya Garrett Gamble presiding. And the jury can sit down when you reach your seat, but make sure there's one more we're going to need there in the corner. That blue chair, I think in we're going to need it. Yeah. Oh. Sorry. Everyone can just move down one, or almost everyone can move down one. One thing I noticed about this judge early on is she's quite the micromanager. You may all be seated while we wait for them. There's one all the way at the end. In the future, just let's, let's fill all the way in at the end. All right. <clears throat> Good morning. Under the rules, the attorneys for both sides are permitted to make their opening statements, which shall consist of a brief statement of the nature of the case that the party expects to prove and the relief sought. Because of the unusual um, status of this case, I'm going to read a statement similar to the one I read to you yesterday morning. This is information from the court. Plaintiffs Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis, the parents of one of the children murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School, have sued Alex Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC for defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress caused by public statements made by Alex Jones and Free Speech Systems, LLC. You are not here to determine if Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems, LLC defamed or intentionally inflicted emotional distress on Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis. The court has already found that they have committed these acts. The jury's job will be to determine what sum of money, if any, would fairly and reasonably compensate Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis for the damages they incurred that were proximately caused by Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC's conduct, as well as what sum of money, if any, should be assessed against Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC as punishment for their conduct. In other words, it's all about the Benjamins and nothing else. Ordinarily, at this stage of the case, the jury would hear all of the evidence on damages in this case, some of the evidence will be presented after you decide compensatory damages and will be followed by a second charge of the court. Right? Just so you understand what's going on. Now, um, as I mentioned yesterday, we always begin with the plaintiff. So, Mr. Bankston, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mark Bankston, and I'm here to talk to you about two rules first. This is the first rule. You can't recklessly tell lies about someone. You can't do it. If you do it, and you cause someone damage, you're responsible. This is the second rule. You can't recklessly tell lies about something important to someone. In this case, like the death of their child. If you do that, you know you're going to cause them harm. You're responsible for that. You're here because those rules are broken. And they were broken in a way in which the world has never seen before. But before we get into that story, you're going to need to understand two things. Who is Alex Jones? What is InfoWars? This is Alex Jones and InfoWars. Alex Jones is one of the country's most popular and most influential media personalities. InfoWars is one of the nation's most popular and widely watched media networks. Now some of you may be forgiven for not knowing about Mr. Jones or the fact that InfoWars is one of our widely watched news networks. And the reason is, is because we now live in a world of bubbles. We now live in a world where we all watch different things. We don't all just turn on the news on one of the three major networks and watch it back in like in the 1950s. We now live in a world where significant parts of this country get their information from things that other parts of the country would never even see. And over the last decade, Mr. Jones has become incredibly influential over a segment of this country. And the thing about Mr. Jones' business is it doesn't quite operate like most media businesses do. Right? Most media businesses are a bit different than Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones started on radio. Right, that's where he became a big star. But Mr. Jones is one of the first people in this country, of media people, to understand the internet and what it could do. 
And long before most me major media organizations even made their first steps into the internet, in the very early days of the 2000s, Mr. Jones was on the internet. And as a result, he has these radio shows, a live broadcast nearly every day. He has an internet website, Infowars.com, where you can view videos, news articles. And he has a YouTube site, or at least he did until very recently. Very recently, meaning four years earlier. Where he got billions of views on that page. The other thing that's different about Mr. Jones's business is that most media businesses make their money through advertising. And you're going to hear from the evidence in this case that Mr. Jones makes a little money that way. That's how they operate. But the main way that this business operates affects the news they cover. Because what they really do, the primary way the business operates is to sell products. As you see here on the screen in Exhibit 15. This is an, another example that you'll see in the sidebar of the articles you'll see in this case. Here's a product called DNA Force. It, it claims it's going to overhaul your body's cellular engines and protect them from reactive oxygen species. Now, these kinds of products dictate the kind of news that has to be told on InfoWars because you want to try to attract the audience that will buy these products. So that's what Mr. Jones did. His, his programming is very fantastical in some respects. In some respects, it's meant to convince you that powerful, shadowy forces in the world are out to get all of us and have put a cloak over reality. And Mr. Jones is going to take that cloak off and show you the real truth. That's, how his, that's what his media network's about. Jones's content is free to use or free to air. He sells products to compensate. I've never bought any of them, but I've known of them for a long time. They didn't push them so heavily before they were banned from everything. And for the past 10 years or so, Mr. Jones has become very influential. He has gained a position in media maybe unlike any other media figure in this country. And when he did that, 10 years ago, in 2012, when his popularity was truly exploding, Mr. Jones made a choice. And he made that choice on December 14th, 2012. That was the day of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Really one of the darkest days in American history. When you gotta think back to 2012 when this happened, we'd never seen anything like this before. I mean, the idea of someone coming in and slaughtering first graders, we were all, all of us, in like a collective state of shock over this. But not Mr. Jones. You see, Mr. Jones made a choice that day. Mr. Jones decided he was going to go on the air that day with the title of a video. And that video was called Connecticut School Massacre Looks Like False Flag, says witnesses. Now, what's a false flag? It's actually, it's interesting, it's an older term, it's a naval term from 17th, 16th century. And what it means is, let's say you were a Spanish ship and you wanted to attack a French ship, but you didn't want to get Spain in trouble. Well, what you could do is you could put up a British flag on your ship. You could fly a false flag. That's what that meant, so that you could attack the French ship without getting Spain in trouble. That's where the term comes from. But in the modern sense, in Mr. Jones's world, false flag now means something very different. A false flag is when a mass tragedy, <coughs> shooting, or bombing was actually staged by the United States government, and particularly the Central Intelligence Agency, and that is fake. It didn't happen. I want to show you. Mr. Jones, on the day of Sandy Hook, as news was coming in of Sandy Hook, on his broadcast he called Connecticut School Massacre looks like false flag, says witnesses. And you'll see that Mr. Jones is talking to somebody who has a relative in Newtown, and he's trying to coax out the information to prove that this was a false flag. Let's take a look at that clip. And I said, this is the attack 
look for, people got to find the clips the last two months i said they are launching attacks they're getting ready i can see them warming up with obama they've got a bigger majority in the congress now in the senate they are going to come after our guns look for mass shootings and then magically it happens they are coming they are coming they are coming as you'll come to see when mr jones says magically it happened that's sarcasm mr jones means that it was planned but it was all staged. That's what he's talking about. And over the next couple of weeks, you will see in this case in, of, the, of the broadcast in 2012, that December, Mr. Jones continually was churning this idea that Sandy Hook was fake. By just one month after the shooting, Alex Jones, who would become patient zero for the Sandy Hook hoax, he had created a sensation. And by a month later, he had aired an entire episode entitled, Why People Think Sandy Hook is a Hoax. And for some of you, I think, and it hit me right at the beginning, is why? Why is he doing this? It's guns. It's about guns. Mr. Jones knew that his audience were worried about their guns. Maybe even rightly, they, they were worried about, you know, people who wanted to own AR-15s, maybe there were going to be some new registration checks, or maybe they were going to ban the AR-15, right? That's people that had that worry. But Mr. Jones played on that fear. He knew it. He knew they felt that way. And so here's what he did. Jones told his audience that Obama was coming for their guns. So he told his audience that Obama stayed Sandy Hook. And not that Obama ordered the murder of those children but that there were never any children at all. That the school was fake. That it wasn't an operating school. That the parents were liars, paid actors. Your Honor? Is that appropriate? No. Well, Your Honor, it's ordered that all demonstrative exhibits be shared with the other side before. And this PowerPoint was not. So. These are words that he's saying, overruled. OK. And yeah, I have shared all the images in this part. Mr. Jones said that the school was fake. It wasn't an operating school. He said that the parents were liars, paid actors. He said the funerals were fake. Their tears were fake. Everything was fake. So that Mr. Jones could have this story on his broadcast. This was a massive campaign of lies. That's what the evidence is going to show you. And in fact, it is difficult to wrap your head around it. We have brought for you, we're going to be showing you in this trial, dozens of videos. 44, I believe. We're going to try to show you before it's all over. And we can't show you all of them, and I'm going to tell you why. If we were to sit down and try to watch all the videos that we have about San Diego, if I just put them on and let's play them and let you watch them, and we're going to spend the rest of this week doing it, we couldn't do it would not have enough time for you to sit here every single day and watch it. So I'm going to have to show you what I can. I'm going to respect your time in that. And we're going to be showing you clips from over years and years and years, and we're going to try to give you the full breadth of what happened. And the other problem we face is we don't even have all the videos. We know there's more out there. You're going to hear testimony about that. You're going to hear expert witnesses talk about it. We don't have it all. We can only show you what we do have. Right? That we, no one really even knows how massive this was. Because some of that is lost to the sands of time. But this was done. This massive campaign of lies was accomplished because Mr. Jones recruited wild extremists from the fringes of the internet who were willing to be as cruel as Mr. Jones needed them to be. The first one of these is a man named Wolfgang Halbig. You're going to hear a lot about this man during this trial. Wolfgang Halbig, you will hear, was a former Florida state trooper. And then apparently he started some sort of security business. And Mr. Halbig was on InfoWars all the time. They just had him on over and over and over. Because Mr. Jones needed somebody who could pretend like they were going to support what he was saying. And Mr. Halbig was willing to do that for attention. I, I want to show you of the many, many times that Mr. Halbert goes on, let's first watch this first clip from September 25th, 2014. 
in an episode entitled Connecticut PD as FBI falsify crime statistics. All right, and what you're going to see in this video is Mr. Jones describing Mr. Halbig, and then I want you to pay attention because you're going to see something very strange. You're going to see Mr. Jones do mocking imitations of the parents crying to try to say that they're fake. You're going to see Mr. Jones say that there are photos of their children that prove that they're still alive, that they faked their deaths. Let's take a look at what Mr. Jones said that day. We're, we're fearless, folks. Support us. Support Wolfgang. This is not a game. This, they are hopping mad we're covering this. CNN admits they did fake scud attacks on themselves back in 1991-1990. Would they stage this? I don't know. Do penguins live in Antarctica? Wolfgang W. Halbig's our guest, former state police officer that worked for the Customs Department, and then over the last decades created one of the biggest, most successful school safety training groups, and he just has gone and investigated, and it's as funny as a $3 bill, and they've been... But man, Wolfgang, you dropped a bombshell of your scores of points, your, your 16 questions. If you've got a school of 100 kids, and then nobody can find them, and then you've got parents laughing on, <laughs> and then they walk over to the camera and go, <laughs> and, 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 but not just one, but a bunch of parents doing this, and then photos of kids that are still alive, they said died. I mean, they think we're so dumb that it's, it's, it's really hidden in plain view. And so the preponderance, I mean, I thought they had some scripting early on to exacerbate and milk the crisis, as Rahm Emanuel said, but when you really look at it, where are the lawsuits? There would be incredible lawsuits and payouts, but there haven't been any filed, nothing. I've never seen this. Uh, this is incredible. That's Mr. Halbig you're seeing on the screen right there. Mr. Halbig would come on the show and they'll do interviews, and we'll see some from Mr. Halbig too. We're going to see some videos of him talking. But that's the guy that he would be bringing on these shows to talk about this over and over and over and over again. The following day, they published this article on Infowars.com. This article reads, FBI says no one killed at Sandy Hook. Now, let's just make this clear. Everyone now agrees. You're going to hear testimony from the author of this article. This is obviously wrong. You're going to hear. He didn't read the chart right. He just didn't scroll down. And they went with this and put it out to their audience. And the important thing about this is this story was InfoWars' third most popular story ever. This was a viral sensation. Millions and millions of people saw this article. You're going to see the data on that. And when Mr. Jones realized the explosive popularity of these kinds of things, he doubled down. You got to remember, we're two years out from Sandy Hook. No network is covering Sandy Hook anymore. Mr. Jones, though, saw how this was doing with his audience. It became an obsession. At InfoWars. You're going to see that there are parts of Mr. Jones' show. You know, he has his live show and he has these internet videos he puts up and he also, has, you know, he does a radio show. So he has call in guests sometimes or call in listeners who will call in and talk about things with Mr. Jones. And they were eating the Sandy Hook stuff up with a spoon and Mr. Jones kept inflaming it. Here's an example from December 29th, 2014. This was called America, the False Democracy. In this clip, you are going to hear Mr. Jones say that these children did not die. Sandy Hook is 100% fake. Uh, let's talk to uh, Kevin. Kevin, uh, go ahead. Uh, you're on the air. Hi, I'm uh, calling about Sandy Hook. Uh, basically, my take on it is I live about 50 miles from Newtown, and the whole thing is pretty much the next step in reality TV because with other false flags like 9-11 or Oklahoma City or the Boston bombing, at least something happened. With Sandy Hook, there's no there there. You've got a bunch of people walking around a parking lot. It's pretty much what it comes down to. And none of the No, no, I've had the t investigators on. I've had... The state police have gone public, you name it. it. The whole thing is a giant hoax. And the problem is, how do you get, deal with a total hoax? I mean, it's just, how do you even convince the public something's a total hoax? Very hard, because, you know, anytime I talk about this issue with people, you know, they, you get criticized, blackballed, ridiculed, call every name in the book, or they respond with the magic words. They were saying on TV, there's no statement 
been more proof positive of somebody who's been brainwashed by that stuff, mainstream media, than those words. They were saying on TV. Well, I always tell people the same thing. Go out and prove the official story. And there's and I knew the millisecond this happened with that now fake picture of the kids being let out of the school, that this there's nothing that's going to sell this agenda like dead elementary school kids. Well, that's right. The general public doesn't know the school was actually closed the year before. They don't know they've shielded all, demolished the building. They don't know that... Uh, they have the kids going in circles in and out of the building as a photo op, blue screen, green screens they got caught using. I mean, the whole thing. But remember, this is the same White House that's been caught running the fake Bin Laden raid that's come out and been faked. Uh, it, it's the same White House that got caught running all these other fake events over and over again. And it's the same White House that says, I never said that you can keep your doctor when he did say you keep your doctor. People just instinctively know that there's a lot of fraud going on. Uh, but it took me about a year with Sandy Hook to come to grips with the fact that the whole thing was fake. I mean, even I couldn't believe it. I knew they jumped on it, used the crisis, hyped it up, but then I did deep research, and my gosh, it just pretty much didn't happen. This kept up into 2015. The next part of our story. You'll see here another one of these call-in segments in an episode on January 13th, 2015. It was called Why We Accept Government Lies. Same kind of format here, except now Mr. Jones is starting to add new stuff. One of the things you'll hear in this video is that now Mr. Jones is saying that there were photos of a child in, at Sandy Hook that were used to stage a fake mass shooting in Pakistan. All right. It's confusing, but we'll get into it. I want you to take a look at this video from January 13th, 2015. To make yeah, when you're trying to, to I mean, decipher cloak and dagger, dirty tricks, it, it's pretty hard to do. It's just that when you then you learn that they were funded by Western funding, the, then you learn that it was the same Amarillo Lockheed connection underwear bomber. Then those are big red flags that they were patsy provocateurs. The classic MO has been followed. And then, yeah, it kind of becomes a red herring, you know, to say the whole thing was staged. Because they have staged events before, but then you learn the school had been closed and reopened, and you got video of the kids going in circles in and out of the building, and they don't call the rescue choppers for two hours, and then they tear the building down and seal it, and they, they get caught using blue screens, and uh, a, a email by Bloomberg comes out in the lawsuit where he's telling his people, get ready in the next 24 hours to capitalize on a shooting. Uh, yeah, so Sandy Hook is a synthetic, completely fake, with actors, in my view, manufactured. I couldn't believe it at first. I knew they had actors there, clearly, but I thought they killed some real kids. And it just shows how bold they are that they clearly used actors. I mean, they even ended up using photos of kids killed in mass shootings here in a fake mass shooting in Turkey. So, yeah, uh, or, or, or Pakistan. The sky is now the limit. I appreciate your call. Shortly after this, InfoWars got its first YouTube strike. This means somebody made a complaint against the channel. In this case, it was a father of a victim. It was a father who had complained to InfoWars because their son's photo was used in one of their videos. It was this whole thing about the Pakistan shooting, and, and we'll get into that. It's not important now. It's obviously a lie. But when they used the son's picture, they complained to YouTube for copyright reasons. That's how they figured they could stop him. So YouTube issued him a strike. But InfoWars smartened up after this, and they realized don't use pictures of the children. That's what you're going to see. So from this point forward, you'll see Mr. Jones react about this and say, this is you know unjust to me, and I'm going to keep doing it. And it did. It kept up. Mr. Jones had Mr. Halbig all through 2015. And you'll see on March 4th, 2015, in this video, it's out of New Bombshell Sandy Hook Information Inbound. Now, I want, before we look at this video, I want to talk about, you've heard some of them already, Mr. Jones is going to keep repeating these same false claims. He's not questioning anything. You've got to make sure there's a big difference here. He's not questioning He's not going, hmm, something fishy might be going on at Sandy Hook. You know, questions, he's just stating facts falsely. And here they are. You'll hear about Anderson Cooper on a blue screen. And you might know about blue screen from, like, Marvel movies. This is how they composite somebody into something. 
The argument here is that San Anderson Cooper of CNN did an interview with a parent in Newtown, and they weren't really in Newtown. They were really on a CNN studio in Atlanta, and they faked it and made it look like Anderson Cooper was there with the parent. But these people weren't even at San Diego. It's a lie. You're going to see it's a lie. It's just an obvious lie. You're going to hear them talking about kids walking in circles, going around the building, doing, doing drills. And you're going to see the video he's talking about in, in his videos. He's going to play it. And what's most astonishing is the video he's showing, the building in the video, isn't even the Sandy Hook school. He just lied to his viewers. It's a firehouse in Newtown, and you're going to see that this video is hours later into the day when parents were showing up to pick up their kids, find out what happened, and there's a group of adults and teenagers and all walking around the building to get to the front of the building. And Mr. Jones tried to sell this to his audience to say that this was fake. It shows that it was the children were actually being let out of the front of the building and then back into the building. And he'll say, well, you should be getting them away from the building. It's not even Sandy Hook. He's going to say, talk about men in SWAT gear caught in the woods. But you're going to see video that proves that they actually knew that the video they're talking about, it's helicopter footage, was taken well into the afternoon, hours after the shooting, had nothing to do with the shooting, and you're going to find out it's some reporters who tried to get too close to the school and take pictures. It's all in the police reports. It's all public. But he tried to convince his viewers that these were um, CIA operatives or whatever in SWAT gear to facilitate the shooting or something. Whatever, whatever false thing he thought was going on here. Now talk about how the school was actually closed. It was not an operating school. That they just opened it up for this day to stock it full of people and did like a stage production. But it was all not real. And, and it's these kind of statements that you're going to see in this case. And the, and the internal communications inside InfoWars, they knew this was a lie. They're not, they're not that. They, don't, they, they know there's copious evidence out there if you really go look for it that Sandy Hook was open. They were saying this knowing it was false. You'll hear him talk about a Michael Bloomberg email the day before. Michael Bloomberg is the former mayor of New York City. And part of what he has done since being mayor is he's been a real big gun control advocate. And they want to have their viewers believe that Michael Bloomberg sent an email to his supporters saying, hey, 24 hours from now, we're going to have a mass shooting. Everybody get ready to mobilize on it. As if Michael Bloomberg had foreknowledge that they were going to fake this shooting. You're not going to see this email because obviously it doesn't exist. It's made up. Just a lie. You're going to hear about rescue helicopters. Why weren't the rescue helicopters called? But you're going to find out. Mr. Jones doesn't know where the rescue helicopters were coming from. He doesn't know how close the hospital was to Sandy Hook Elementary. And you're going to hear that those EMS, they would have gotten there way faster than a helicopter from way far away. You're going to hear all sorts of things about the ambulances and the EMTs. He tells his audience that they never even allowed EMTs in the building. And, and I'm guessing here is you don't have to get the EMTs in on the conspiracy, right? You just keep them out of the building, they'll never know it was all fake. It's garbage. EMTs went in that building, anybody can verify it. It's not hard to figure that out. Most of them have given interviews about what they saw that day. It was the worst day of their lives. You're going to hear about that response that day. And yeah, EMTs were in there. He's going to tell you that they sealed the death certificates and that even owning one is a felony. That's on an InfoWars episode you're going to see. And the truth is, any one of you could right now get on, call up Newtown Clerk, and get one for $20. Any of the victims. It's just a lie. You're going to hear him say, as you've already heard him say, that there are photos of the victims who are still alive. This is so disgusting, so repulsive, that I feel silly standing here and telling you that's false. But that's what I have to do in this case. That's where we're at. I want to show you a video of him saying all these things. This is when Mr. Halbert comes on the show again. And let's listen to what Mr. Jones has to say. Uh, Mr. Halbert, thanks for coming on. Recap who you are. Recap why you question kind of the top 10 or 15 points that I know are on your website uh, of, of why this doesn't add up and 
and, and then now they're really trying to, 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 to seal everything when they could discredit us anytime they wanted to. Just tell us why Anderson Cooper's nose disappears, why it's blue screen. Uh, just tell us why the people are walking in circles in and out of the building. It appears to be staged. Tell us why they said they didn't catch somebody in the woods when they did. Uh, tell us why the school was closed before and then after, why they've sealed it all, why they've now torn it down. Tell us why Bloomberg sent out an email to his people the day before saying get ready to launch an operation to capitalize on a mass shooting. Tell us why you didn't launch the emergency helicopters. Tell us why the, the ambulance is parked for, for an hour down the road. Uh, tell us you know, tell us why this appears to be as phony as the $3 bill. Wolfgang, thank you for joining us. And you'll notice these aren't questions. Tell us why this happened. Because it did happen, according to Mr. Jones. It'd be like if somebody came up to you and said, tell me why you're a thief. Tell me why you're a liar. Tell me why you're a murderer. It's not a question. That's not what Mr. Jones was doing. You're going to see that by November 2015, there was more people getting involved in this. As I told you, Mr. Jones was recruiting wild extremists from the fringes of the Internet. One of those gentlemen was a man named Jim Fetzer. Jim Fetzer, InfoWars helped distribute his book, Nobody Died at Sandy Hook. Jim Fetzer was a former professor who, in his twilight years, started doing things like this and wanted his stuff featured on Mr. Jones' show. And InfoWars wanted to help him. And you're going to see the internal emails in which InfoWars helps him distribute this book, this horrific book. The next month, it's important to know that at least a couple of people inside of InfoWars knew what was happening was wrong. They knew it. They didn't just know it, they warned them. Editor-at-large Paul Watson, the editor-at-large of the company, warned Mr. Jones in writing. Now I know that's probably hard for some of y'all to see, so I'm going to read this to you. There's an email you will see. This is from Paul Watson, the editor at InfoWars to Buckley at InfoWars, who's another managerial employee, and Anthony at InfoWars, who you'll hear is another managerial employee. And he says, sent this to Alex. He says, this Sandy Hook stuff is killing us. It's promoted by the most batshit crazy people, like Rince and Fetzer, who all hate us anyway. Plus, it makes us look really bad to align with people who harass the parents of dead kids. It's going to hurt us with Drudge and bringing bigger names into the show. Plus, the event happened three years ago. Why even risk our reputation for it? And when he's talking about Drudge, some of you all probably know, he's talking about Drudge Report, um, a, a website that combine, compiles news links. And if a media organization gets featured on Drudge, it gets a lot of traffic. So Mr. Watson wasn't so much concerned about the morality here. He was concerned it's going to make us look bad and it's going to hurt us with drudge. This is about money. This is about the bottom line, what he was trying to get Alex Jones to see. And Mr. Watson had very good reason to be alarmed, not just because of the things that were being said on InfoWars and the things that were being written, but what, what Mr. Jones was doing on top of that. And one of those things was sending his reporter to Newtown, Connecticut. <coughs> And what you're going to see is that this reporter, Dan Bedondi, who you will find out is a former professional wrestler, he went to Newtown and confronted people in Newtown. I want to show you a video of that. This is going to be Mr. Bedondi following around Newtown city officials. And I want you to hear what he says to me. <laughs> He's covering up the whole operation. They had communication with the helicopter, the line on the stand. Uh, that's perjury, sir. You know what perjury is? I'm coming to jail, criminal. This is out there. You're going to jail, criminal. How come with your requirement? And you, sir, are defending criminals. How do you feel about that? You know, you're, this guy here is somebody out of Central Casting, I'm telling you. This is the exact person that they would hire to represent criminals, folks. The Sandy Hook truth is coming out, you people going to jail. You can smile all you want, you're going to jail for fraud. Plain and simple. 
Are you looking at Financial Stand the Dining, the InfoWars.com, the number one alternative news source in the world? Yo, live right on the wall. Live right on here. What do you have to say about defending criminals? You're a bunch of frauds, a bunch of criminals. Enjoy your Federal Reserve notes now, scumbags. I see those people, folks. They're talking about Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook was an inside job. And the thing about this is, is that I think you can tell from this video, Mr. Badondi, that reporter, he probably believes this stuff. I mean, he's, he's being, Mr. Jones used him just as much as anybody. This poor guy, not, not maybe, you know, not the sharpest thinker sometimes, but maybe believes this. Mr. Jones doesn't. He was happy to have this happen, and you will see that these videos are featured on Infowars where they bragged about scaring the people of Newtown. <coughs> and it wasn't just editor Paul Watson warning Mr. Jones. The warnings came not only from Infowars employees, Mr. Jones and Infowars was warned by their viewers that what they were doing was wrong. <coughs> and you're going to hear about people who are online debunkers. People who were so horrified that they felt they wanted to make it their duty to try to debunk and disprove the things that InfoWars was saying. And those people also contacted the company and let them know in no uncertain terms the potential legal consequences from where this was headed. That happened. <coughs> but it didn't matter. It didn't matter that they warned him, told them that what they were doing was wrong, told them that what they were doing is false, because InfoWars already knew that. They already knew they were lying. They knew it was false. Here's the thing. You're going to see that you're going to hear testimony from the company that they admit they received a huge volume of emails from Wolfgang Halbig and Jim Fetzer that were crazy. And they knew that. And they admit it. And you're going to hear that they knew that Halbig and Fetzer and others were harassing the parents. <coughs> And they didn't care. Didn't bother them in the slightest. This kept up into 2016. And one of the things that you might remember about 2016 is the 2016 presidential election. Mr. Jones became a major topic during that election. Some of you may remember, in fact, that Mr. Jones' lies were discussed by Clinton in her campaign speeches. Mr. Jones didn't like this. <coughs> Mr. Jones fashions himself as a political enemy and rival of Hillary Clinton. And when she said this about him, he was mad. And he decided to respond. So he released a video on November 18, 2016. And it was called his final statement on Sandy Hook. It was not his final statement. It was very, very disturbing. You're going to see a couple things in this video. You're going to see that Mr. Jones, for the first time, directly addresses the complaints of the parents who had been outraged about this. And he's going to say about that, that that is suspicious, that they protest too much, that they must be hiding something. And at the end of this long rant, you're going to hear Mr. Jones look right into this camera, tell the people directly. He will address the people who say their parents that I see on TV. And what he says to them is, my heart would go out to you. But the problem is, I've seen actors before, and I know when I'm watching a movie, and I know when I'm watching something real. And you see Mr. Jones nodding along with that. Hear and why that. should anybody fear an investigation if they have nothing to hide. In fact, isn't that in Shakespeare's Hamlet? Methinks you protest too much. So here is my statement for the media when they call up saying, where do you stand on this? Where I've always stood. When there were other mass shootings, I would simply point out that they're very rare statistically and why should we all give up our rights? Because some other bad person does something. A guy with a car runs over 50 people. Do we ban driving cars? It's the same thing. And there have been other instances of shootings that are very suspicious. Aurora is one. Just look into that. But this particular case, they are so scared of investigation. So everything they do basically ends up blowing up in their face. 
So you guys are gonna get what you want now. I'm gonna start reinvestigating Sandy Hook and everything else that happened with it. I'm Alex Show signing off from InfoWars.com. If you're watching this transmission, think for yourself. I know it's a thought crime. And then ask yourself, what is it so strange about Sandy Hook and that tragedy? But I will say this, finally, uh, my heart does go out to all parents that lose children, whether it's to stabbings or whether it's to car wrecks or whether it's to stranglings or whether it's to blunt force trauma or murder, uh, firearms, whatever the case is, I'm a parent and my heart goes out to all parents that have lost children uh, in these tragic events. And so if children were lost in Sandy Hook, my heart goes out to each and every one of those parents and the people that say they're parents that I see on the news. The only problem is I've watched a lot of soap operas and I've seen actors before. And I know when I'm watching a movie, I know when I'm watching something real. Let's look at the Sandy Hook. This man knew that the parents of murdered children were emotionally distressed, outraged, grieving, and he looked straight into that camera and he said, the only problem is I've watched a lot of soap operas and I've seen actors before and I know when I'm watching a movie and I know when I'm watching something real. It kept going. It just kept going. It doesn't stop. 2017. And it's still going. They're still making videos saying it's phony as a $3 bill. In fact, one of those from that year that I want to talk to you about was called Sandy Hook Vampires Exposed. And in that video, Mr. Jones says that the media, the central intelligence, the, the parents that say their parents that he sees on the news, the people who are the fake crisis actors, the people who are faking the interview of Anderson Cooper, they're all vampires of Sandy Hook. And he says, all the same fake stuff again. The school wasn't even open. And it was rotting and falling apart. It didn't even look like a real school. And he asks, why haven't we seen any pictures of bodies? Him and his nightly news director, Mr. Dew, they wanted to see the bodies. And at this point, in 2017, they are at their breaking point. At this point, there had been an ongoing nationwide controversy that was all churned by Jones. There was Jones's public denial of their son's violent death. And they were getting harassment by Mr. Halbig and other followers of Jones. They were at their breaking point. And so Neil made a decision, a very tough decision. He made the decision on June 19, 2017, he decided he agreed to an interview with Megyn Kelly. So to speak to Alex Jones, he went on Megyn Kelly. I'm not sure that makes any sense, unless he just wanted to make some quick money so he could pay for a lawyer to send Jones a cease and desist letter. No, he didn't do that either. Well, that's kind of weird. I think some of y'all may remember Megyn Kelly used to have an NBC show. It's called Megyn Kelly Tonight. It's a news magazine. And he thought when Ms. Kelly asked him if he would come on the show because she was doing a profile about Mr. Jones, he thought, if I go on the show and I say, please stop, please stop, I'm a real dad, he thought if Mr. Jones was be, to be able to look him in the eyes and see him, that he could solve this. And so he went on Ms. Kelly's show in front of a national televised audience and said, look, I'm a real dad. I, I lost my son. I buried my son. I held my son with a bullet hole through his head. Please stop. And Neil was hopeful. Neil was really hopeful that it would stop. It did not. On June 25th, 2017, InfoWars struck back directly at Mr. Hustler. They retaliated. And they did it in a disgusting way. They aired a video that said, talked about Neil's interview on Megyn Kelly and said, hmm, one problem. Mr. Heslin's a liar. Mr. Heslin never held his child. He made up that story. 
And we can prove it. Because you see, according to InfoWars version of events, the shooting was fake. And all these fake actor parents, who were like paid actors of the CIA, were given a cover story. And one of the easiest parts of their cover story, apparently, was that they didn't release the bodies of the children to the parents. And the idea being, if you don't have to worry about the bodies and all that sort of stuff, it makes it easier to pull off this fakery. So they had all these paid actors say, we never got the children. The bodies were never released to us. But the allegation here is that Mr. Heslin forgot his cover story and said something that wasn't true, that he held his child. They did this by deceptively editing video interviews. The first is of this man. You're going to see this when these videos are played. I'm going to play you this video about Mr. Heslin. And this man is Dr. Wayne Carver. He is the medical examiner who had the incredibly difficult job of seeing those children after some time. And what you're going to see, the evidence will show you that, that Dr. Carver in this interview was talking about the process by which the children were identified. All right? They got all the children, and they got to get the parents into contact. Right? And he'll talk about how the way you do that is through photograph. Right? You don't want, and the reason you do that is it's thus traumatic, and you don't want to bring a parent into the room of a body of a child that's not theirs. All right? So you want to do this by photograph. Make sure that you get them lined up before you do that. And as you'll hear, he'll even say, there's a time and a place for up close and personal. But first you identify by photograph. They actually edited this video in such a way to make it look like, oh no, the parents were only shown photographs of their children. Or that was the story, anyway. And it's actually just a, a complete deception, sleight of hand, by editing this man's interview. They do the same thing with these parents. This is Lynn and Christine McDonald. And Lynn and Christine McDonald, you'll see in this interview, we're talking about the process of being at the funeral home of their daughter and her casket. And, you know, as a mom, when your child has suffered these kinds of injuries, you have to make a very difficult decision. And what that decision is whether to open that casket. And Ms. McDonald made a decision not to. And you're going to hear, you'll, have, you'll hear expert testimony talking about this interview, where you'll see that Miss McDonald wanted her little daughter, she wanted to remember her just the way she was. So she didn't look. And what InfoWars did is they took her interview and they cut her off mid-sentence and made it look like she was never allowed to see her children. Both of these things, all of this stuff you're going to see in this video, came from this anonymous blog post that had information from that gentleman, Jim Fetzer, who InfoWars, you'll hear testimony, that they knew, at the time they published this broadcast, they knew Mr. Fetzer was crazy, completely unreliable. They didn't care. They were doing this to retaliate against Neil, who had the temerity, the audacity, to stand up on national television and tell him to stop. My opinion, going on NBC is almost like doing a made-for-TV movie or something. It only made them question it more. Kind of like this trial. So, folks, now, here's another story. You know, I don't even know if Alex knows about this, to be honest with you. Alex, if you're listening and you want to... Uh, or if you just want to know what's going on. Zero Hedge has just published a story. Megyn Kelly fails to fact check Sandy Hook's Sandy Hook father's contradictory claim in Alex Jones' hit piece. Now again, this, this broke, I think it broke today, I don't know what time, but featured in Megyn Kelly's expose, Neil Heslin, a father of one of the victims, during the interview, described what happened the day of the shooting and basically what he said, the statement he made, fact checkers on this have said cannot be accurate. He's claiming that he held his son and saw the bullet hole in his head. That is his claim. Now, according to a timeline of events and a coroner's testimony, that is not possible. And so one must 
look at Megyn Kelly and say, Megyn, I think it's time for you to explain this contradiction in the narrative. Because this is only going to fuel the conspiracy theory that you're trying to put out, in fact. So, and here's the thing, too. You would remember, let me see how long these clips are. You would remember if you held your dead kid in, in your hands with a bullet hole. That's not something that you would just misspeak on. So let's roll the clip first. Neil Heslin telling Megyn Kelly of his experience with his, with, uh, with his kid. At Sandy Hook Elementary School, one of the darkest chapters in American history was a hoax. I washed my son. I buried my son. I held my son with a bullet hole through his head. Neil Heslin's son, Jesse, just six years old, was murdered, along with 19 of his classmates and six adults, on December 14th, 2012, in Newtown, Connecticut. Yeah, I dropped him off in 904. That's when we dropped him off at school with his book bag. Uh, hours later, I was picking him up in a body bag. So making a pretty extreme cl claim that would be a very thing vivid in your memory, holding his dead child. Now here is an account from the coroner that does not cooperate with that narrative. Uh, we did not bring the bodies and the families into contact. We took uh, pictures of them, um, of, of their facial features. You have, uh, uh, it's, it's easier on the families when you do that. Uh, a time and a place for a close and personal in the grieving process but to accomplish this uh, we felt it would be best uh, to do it this way and uh, you can sort of uh, you can control the situation uh, depending on your photographer and I have very good photographers uh, but uh, it's going to be we hard not to have been able to actually see her well, at first I thought that, and I had questioned maybe wanting to see her. Okay, so just another question that people are now going to be asking about Sandy Hook, the conspiracy theorists on the internet out there that have a lot of questions that are yet to get answered. I mean, you can say whatever you want about the event, that's just a fact. So there's another one. Will there be a clarification from Heslin or Megyn Kelly? I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> so now they're fueling the conspiracy theory claims. Unbelievable. We'll be right back with more. The man you just saw, his name is Owen Schroeder. He's another media star at InfoWars. Sort of Mr. Jones' protege. And what you just saw there was a manufactured, fabricated lie specifically engineered and calculated to hurt Neil Heslin and Scarlett Rose, to retaliate against Neil for daring to speak out, proposing any sort of resistance to Mr. Jones' years of cruelty. They struck back against him. And it didn't end there. Right? Now, now Neil and his family had been introduced into the Sandy Hook conspiracy. They were a key part of it now. They were a focus of this lie. And it didn't end. A month later, you're going to see that there was significant controversy over this video you just saw. And Mr. Jones, a month later, doubled down and defended it. He got on a show, he played that entire video again, and then he said this. He said, that was a month ago. He, meaning Mr. Schroyer, had said, I wouldn't hold my breath looking for a response. We've not seen a clarification. Mr. Jones then said, the stuff I found was they never let them see their bodies. This is Jesse. And the thing that I think is really important to understand about Neil and Scarlett's state of mind when this video came out is, you know, obviously Neil is talking about the last moments he spent with his little boy. And Alex Jones came along, and he took that memory, 
that rather beautiful memory, and he ruined it, and he tarnished it, and he made it ugly. And now every single time that Neil Haslam has to think about the last moments he spent with Jesse, he also has to think about this horrible man, this disgusting series of lies that will be ever, forever tied to his son's death. That Jesse's legacy had now become tied to this. That there would always be an asterisk next to his name. That there would be this contingent of people who would come out of the woodwork and decide they needed to confront Neil and Scarlett about this. And Neil and Scarlett spent the next years up until the day they're sitting in this courthouse dealing with this fallout. Of having all of these people think that they're liars, crisis actors, CIA agents, and their son Jesse didn't even live. I want to talk about what this trial means. Because there has never been anything like this. All right? There are lots of defamation cases in the past. It is, in fact, our oldest human law. Objection to argument, Your Honor. It's overruled. Defamation is one of the oldest laws we have in human society. Many of you know it in another form, in its earliest form from the dawn of man. We do not bear false witness against our neighbors. We believe that as a people, and we have since the moment we all started sitting down and living in cities together. And in the modern form, we see defamation cases. And that would, you know, sometimes be about a news article or a book, or a video on TV, or in some cases, maybe a couple of articles, or a series of videos. But never, never in the human history of defamation has somebody for 10 years, over and over and over, to a global audience, harassed, lied, and attacked the parents of murdered children for 10 years, causing huge portions of this country and indeed the globe to doubt them and their story. It has never happened. Where people are showing up and confronting the parents of murdered children in public, threatening their lives, it's never happened. This trial is different than anything that's ever gone on in this courtroom. And you're not here to decide whether all this happened. I think we all know that now. We're going to see the videos. Nobody doubts that the videos were published. You're going to see the black and white documents. You're going to see the internal emails. But you're not going to have to decide whether all this happened. And you know that you're not here to decide whether Mr. Jones is legally responsible. That's also not something you need to decide. And this also has nothing to do with the Constitution. Because defamation is not protected by freedom of speech, okay? We decided that long ago as a people. It, it actually recalls some of the words written by our old Chief Justice, William Rehnquist, who's the former Chief Justice of the United States. And he wrote, he wrote in Hustler versus Falwell. Your Honor, same objection to argument. Um, I'm gonna allow it, but make sure you... It's very brief, Your Honor. Okay, so overall. In Hustler versus Fall, just, Justice Rehnquist said this, false statements of fact are particularly valueless. They interfere with the truth-seeking function of the marketplace of ideas, and they cause damage to an individual's reputation that cannot easily be repaired by counterspeech, however persuasive or effective. It's for that reason that we do not protect defamation, false speech. Because speech is free, but lies you have to pay for. There is also no question that Neil and Scarlett suffered harm. I don't know what InfoWars lawyers are going to get up here and say. I don't. But one thing I know they will not tell you is that Neil and Scarlett weren't harmed by this. That's not going to happen. They won't tell you that. Because we all know that happened. And 
the testimony will show that free speech systems admits that its conduct harmed the plaintiffs. They'll admit what they did to these parents' grieving process. They'll admit it. They just don't care. And they do not believe that they should have to pay anything beyond a dollar for it. They think that the pain that they admit that they caused has no value. None. They're going to stand up here after the things that you've just seen, admitting that they did wrong, admitting that they caused the harm, and they're going to have the absolute gall to say, give them a dollar. That's what they're going to do. You have two tasks. There's two things you've got to do while you're in this quarter. The first task is how much money should Neil and Scarlett be paid for the harm Mr. Jones has caused. The second thing you're going to have to consider is how much money will it take to punish Mr. Jones for his actions. That's it. Those are the only two things you're here to do today through this trial. And I want to talk really briefly about the burden of proof for doing that, because that came up a little bit during jury selection. And you'll notice they use this term, preponderance of the evidence. And ever since I came out of law school long ago, I do not know why we use words like that. That is dumb. Why do we talk that way? It really, because there's such an easy way to say it, and I think everybody in the courtroom will agree with me, <coughs> the defense counsel will agree, that what preponderance of the evidence means is, is a fact more likely <coughs> true than not true. Just a slight tipping of the scales. If you think you could flip a coin flip and it's better than those odds, that's more likely true than not true. And that's how we decide things in a civil court. Obviously, most of the things, like about whether he did something wrong or whether these videos are published, you won't have to decide that. So this actually isn't going to be that difficult in this case because the evidence that you're going to see is going to fill up that scale you see that's pushing down. It's going to weigh it way down because what goes in that part of the scale is the harm to Neil and Scarlett. And the evidence of that is overwhelming. You're going to be hearing a lot about it. You see, Mr. Jones knew that his lies would damage Neil's reputation. He knew that. He knew that if he cast Neil and his family into the middle of this Sandy Hook lie, that millions of people across this country were going to believe it, that they were going to harass these people, that their lives were going to get more difficult, not because of what was going on in their minds, but what was going on in the minds of the millions of people who saw this. He knew that damage would happen. He doesn't care. He thinks it's worth a dollar. What I want you to remember about this is this number. 24%. You are going to hear expert testimony in this case that will tell you that that number, 24%, at the time all these events were happening, is the percent of people in this country who believe that Sandy Hook was either definitely or possibly staged. One in four Americans. And you're going to hear expert testimony that Mr. Jones was the only voice of any importance whatsoever, the only commercial media figure at all to spread these lies. That there was, these were things that were confined to the weird corners of the internet, bizarre Facebook groups and weird little YouTube videos and you know, these crazy professors writing their anonymous blogs, nobody with millions and millions and millions of followers. And nobody was doing it. It was Mr. Jones. And you're going to hear expert testimony that Mr. Jones and his conduct is the nearly exclusive driver of this. That as Mr. Jones put that out and his followers put that out and it spread like a virus through the internet. And you're going to hear how had it not been for Mr. Jones, this number would be trivial. Because it would have never gone beyond the most crazy <coughs> places on the internet. So I'll admit that I was once one of those 24%, but I wasn't listening to Jones at the time. I just don't believe shit I see on TV, and I think the number, 24%, is actually a lot higher, especially nowadays, but I'd guess it was at least 35%, probably higher, even back then. The reason for this isn't Alex Jones. It's the way it gets forced down our throats, the very Hollywood-like production style of mainstream media.
and also watching someone have their life's work destroyed for not believing every last word we're told without question. Has the establishment media considered that maybe people don't like seeing victims turned into celebrities only to be used for political propaganda? I mean, come on, man. The older I get, the harder it becomes to give a damn about whatever the media is selling at any given moment. It's just so tedious. And you're going to hear how for 10 years, Mr. Jones's lies have inspired his guests to harass Neil and Scarlett. That's something you're going to hear. You're going to hear how guests and viewers who believed Mr. Jones' lies contacted Neil and Scarlett at home, that they accosted them in public. They harassed them online and by telephone, and that they threatened their very lives. Mr. Jones knew that his lies about Jesse's death would cause severe emotional distress to Neil and Scarlett. He didn't just knew it, he intended it. Intended to inflict emotional distress. This was his goal. It wasn't that he committed an accident. It wasn't that he was just not careful. He intended to hurt them, and now he wants to pay a dollar. But for 10 years, Mr. Jones has robbed Neil and Scarlett of the time they needed to heal over the violent death of their son, Jesse, because Mr. Jones wanted to sell more of his products. That's the reality. You're going to hear how Mr. Jones' lies caused Neil and Scarlett to get stuck in loops of negative thinking about Jesse's death. Right? And what we mean by this is when your thoughts don't have an off switch. You're going to hear expert psychological testimony, medical testimony from medical experts, that what this is called is forced rumination. Rumination is obsessive thinking about a tragic situation when it interferes with your normal function. And that's what was happening to Neil and Scarlett over the past 10 years. For 10 years, Jones has used his campaign of lies about the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting to force <coughs> Neil and Scarlett to ruminate about the violent loss of their son, Jesse. Whenever Neil encounters the Sandy Hook lie, he can think of nothing else. And whenever Scarlett encounters the Sandy Hook lie, she shuts down and isolates. It didn't have to be this way. I want to make crystal clear to all of you, we are not here today to seek compensation for the death of their child and the grief that comes along with losing a child. A lot of parents lose children, way more than we want. It's accidents, disease, firearms. We've actually gotten to the point where firearms is a leading cause of death of children. Parents have to deal with this. And yes, it's horrible. But with qualified medical intervention and time, you can heal. You don't get better. You just heal. You develop scar tissue. You come to a place of closure. You come to a place of acceptance. And the grief will always be with you. But if you can do it in a healthy way, the outcomes for a parent who's lost a child you're going to hear are, are OK. You can get them to be in an OK place. People like Neil and Scarlett can heal over time if they are allowed to shape their past and present circumstances. But Neil and Scarlett were prevented from healing because they had to contend with Alex Jones' lies. Dealing with this conspiracy of lies for 10 years put a lot of life stressors on Neil and Scarlett, which led to a substantial decline in their well-being and caused them to continually suffer aggravated mental anguish. That is what you will hear from a medical professional psychological professionals are going to tell you this. And that's one of the other things you're going to compensate for in this case. 
We talked a lot about mental anguish yesterday, but it's that and the reputation, right? It's about what went on in their minds. That's the mental anguish. But in the millions of other people's minds, that's the reputation damage. Both of those things happened to Neil and Scarlett. That's not the only thing you're going to have to consider, though. You're going to hear evidence over the next coming days that relates to the things you'll need to consider for punitive damages. And as we talked about, these are the damages designed to punish the defendant and also to deter, to convince every other media organization that if they go down this path, if they try to copy Mr. Jones's formula, it will not be a good thing for them. Hopefully, this trial will be able to deter and prevent any other media organizations from following the same cruel path. Because what you have to remember is that Mr. Jones, for 10 years, intentionally lied that the shooting was fake or a government-led plot. When I say 10 years, it's because I want you to understand this hasn't stopped. Bringing this lawsuit did not solve this. You can look at what Mr. Jones has said afterwards, and you can see inside of his mind and know how malicious he was, because he is still saying Sandy Hook is synthetic. I want to show you a video from October 1st, 2021, just last year, in which Mr. Jones says that, you know what? My original instinct was right. You know, at first I thought it was fake, then I thought maybe it's real, and, and now, he says, seeing how fake and synthetic everything is, maybe it was right. Maybe Alex Jones is always right. That's what you're about to hear him say. I want to show you this video from October 1st, 2021. Just like the New York Times lying about WMDs on purpose and all their evil things. And, oh, but I questioned one of the big events they hyped up because of a lot of the anomalies, and I have a right to question that. In fact, I, for a while, thought it didn't happen, then I thought it probably did. And now, seeing how synthetic everything is, and my original instinct, maybe Alex Jones is always I'm pretty much right 99% of the time, folks, and so are you. I mean, we all know this is easy to look at to see what's happening. And you've seen it here today, Mr. Jones still nodding along. Mr. Jones, you'll hear, he still thinks. It's cover up, Sandy Hook. Keeps pushing it, because it's important that his audience not hear him retract it. It's important that if he was to go out and say, yeah, I was wrong. Yeah, I, I need to be accountable. That will destroy him with his audience. Can't do it. He won't do it. You sure about that, Junior? About it. I believe it happened. And I'm sorry for the families. I gotta take my licks. I'm ready. Everything else now is take my licks. Is that why you? That means my to... kids gotta take the licks. My family's gotta take the licks. And I gotta take the licks. I'm ready to take the licks. So let's get it going here. Somebody with God forever. It doesn't matter anymore. I'm taking my licks. You need to understand that he intentionally lied to sell supplements. That's what he did. Mr. Jones used Jesse's death to sell his products. That is the reality. And Mr. Jones retaliated against Neil for speaking out. Mr. Jones told the world that Neil was lying about holding Jesse's body. Because Mr. Jones will do or say anything to protect his ability to profit off his lies. This is a case about creating change. You have the power to stop this from ever happening again. You can put an end to these lies by punishing Alex Jones. You can make that part of Jesse's legacy. You can make Jesse's legacy this trial <coughs> in which he can hopefully, Jesse's legacy, can prevent this from ever happening to another family, to another set of victims. That can be Jesse's legacy. But just as importantly is compensating Neil and Scarlett for the harm that they suffered. And I remember when we were talking in jury selection, when my partner, Mr. Ball, was talking to you. 
we were a lot of us were talking about how it's difficult to wrap your mind around something abstract like mental anguish, reputation damages. And I know one of the things you're going to find out that's going to be that's why we all are for. We're going to tell you everything we can. We're going to give you all the instructions we can. We're going to show you all the evidence, but it's going to be up to you. And one of the ways that I think right now, obviously, I'm just an opening statement. I can't show you everything. But one of the things I think you should think about, a number you should keep in mind, something to help wrap your head around this level of damage, is this number, that 24%. The number of people in this country who believe that Sandy Hook was definitely or possibly staged. This pool of people who do not believe Neil and Scarlett, these pool of people who doubt them, from out of which come these followers who harass them, that group of people is 75 million people. And we would submit to you that a fair measure, analysis, of the level of harm that was done to Neil's reputation out of all of this is one dollar for every one of those people. Just one dollar. 75 million. And we would submit to you too that the emotional damage that was done to Neil and Scarlett, which you will hear through, through medical experts. We'd submit to you that that is at least as valuable as what happened to their reputation, at least. In this case, that has never had anything like this ever happen before. Another 75 million. And that is why, at the end of evidence, we're gonna come and we're gonna ask you for a verdict of $150 million. Now that is a huge verdict, to be sure, but it is one that will do justice to the level of harm done in this case. Harm that was done to the parents of, grieving parents of murdered children who have had to endure for 10 years the most despicable and vile campaign of defamation and slander in American history. We look forward to telling you their story. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Bankston. We are going to take our morning break. All rise. All rise, please. You are on motion. All right, you may be seated. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. At this time, the defense would move for a mistrial based on a violation of the Civil Practice and Remedies Code, Chapter 31.0011. Um, Mr. Bankston's opening statement squarely put before the jury. Um, content that the Civil Practice and Remedies Code that the Texas Legislature says should not be in an opening statement in the first pace, uh, first part of a bifurcated trial, uh, and therefore we'd ask for a mistrial. All right, well this is not, as we, have, as we have discussed at length, a traditional bifurcated trial. The only element, the only issue, and the only type of evidence that is bifurcated is the evidence on Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems Network, which was not discussed in the opening statement. The motion is denied. Thank you, Your Honor. And just a reminder that we'll need to take up a quick thing about a board here. That's fine. If I stand up, everybody stands up. Thank you, Your So, when the feed returns, we suddenly cut into the middle of this discussion without any explanation. Thing outside of this courtroom. Every participant in this trial, every party, every lawyer is ordered to be silent outside of this courtroom or if there is any member of the jury within sight. And on the fifth floor entirely, no talking about this case at all. No talking about anything because my jury cannot be hearing any of that. Is this understood? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. We need to shut that door. Can you do it? I didn't know if you need the rest of my counsel. They just came and told you you needed me. They are welcome to come in. I need at least one person right. from each side, and I needed Mr. Jones to hear me, that sure. if he is asked a question, he is not allowed to answer on the fifth floor. You can go down to the first floor, it's fine. You see a jury member, you may not say anything. And neither may anyone else. I just don't think they're going to be asked. Um, also, at 5 o'clock, this building is closed. So if you 
want to be interviewed, you got to do that outdoors. Or even if you don't want to be. <laughs> it's outdoors. It's not in the building. We end at 5, and everyone must immediately pack up and leave. Potentially the lawyers can stay and talk to me. All right. What was the issue? Mr. Benson doesn't like my demonstrative exhibit. I, uh... Yeah, my actually did my other is this one is just broadcast they don't that's not the thing. they don't they're not they don't broadcast over airwaves it's just factually incorrect uh, but as far as this one oh we want to put that on there okay so my problem here my objection here your honor is that this is a factual claim that there were 27 hours spent on Sandy Oak and that constitutes less than one percent of this number but they violated discovery orders to produce us that material. We know there's tons more of Sandy Hook videos. We've had briefing this court from the experts to prove it. And we've never been able to establish the total amount of time that they spent on it. And they could have established that, but they I'm did sorry, not. You said I'm <laughs> Can I put this down? You can. I've okay. seen it. Uh, Your Honor, we just had a conference where we agreed on Exhibit 31 as being the totality of the Sandy Hook videos. I mean, we just did that. If that is. Well, I wasn't in the conference. What was agreed to me was that these are the videos that are admitted in court. This case is in its unique and frustrating situation because of the choices your clients have made. Period. I understand That's the right. end of the day on that. Council and I agreed on Exhibit 31 as a summary exhibit of the the videos that were done between 2012 and the filing of the lawsuit in 2018. That is not what my I wasn't there. What was presented to me is here is an agreed list of the videos admitted into evidence. Those are two different things. I would love to be presiding over a trial in which a full discovery process unfolded properly and according to the rules. It did not. Not because of my choice, not because of the plaintiff's choice, because of the defendant's choices. They are stuck with the consequences of those choices. I'm not going to let you use those demonstratives. Understood. Anything else? We had the issue that I raised to you from Chambers earlier. I don't know how you feel. I don't want to have that conversation out here. Out here, exactly. Yes. So whenever you want to, just let me know. All right. So I'm, I'm not done with my break. Um, we're going to go about three more minutes over because I had to deal with all of that. I'm going to make sure that whoever is out there, and I don't know who it is, knows what my orders are now going forward. Mm. Mr. Bankston, you'll tell your team. I think all of you were in here when I issued the orders about the hallway and the building. Is that right? All right. So then everyone should understand that. All right. I'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, all right. You may be seated. Mr. Renal, are you ready? I am, Your Honor. All right. You may proceed. May it please the court. Yes. We heard a lot about rules at the beginning of the personal injury lawyer's presentation. I'm going to tell you the most important rule I learned as a young lawyer. In case anybody can't read my handwriting, that says do not lie to the jury if you hope to get the verdict that you've requested. What we heard was a conspiracy of lies. The truth is going to come from that witness stand. It's going to be in the documents, the records, the evidence. My mentor, who I'm lucky enough to have sitting at this table with me, told me a long time ago to keep track of the other side's opening statement and write down their misrepresentation. So you can come back to the jury in closing argument and show them where they haven't kept their word. You see, a lawyer's opening statement is not like a politician's speech. You don't get to see if the politician is going to keep her word 
before you vote for her. You get to see if we keep our word before you vote in this case. My name is Andino Reynal, and I am honored to represent Alex Jones and FSS. He is one of the most polarizing figures in this nation. And I am honored to represent him, not because I agree with everything that he says, but because I believe in his right to say it, <coughs> and I believe in every American's right to choose what they watch, and what they listen to, and what they believe. Mr. Bankston's first lie came at 9.37 a.m. when he said that InfoWars was one of the most significant networks in the USA. In fact, the evidence will show that in 2018, InfoWars was completely deplatformed. You will not find InfoWars on YouTube. You will not find InfoWars on Facebook. You will not find InfoWars on Twitter. You will find it absolutely nowhere. Mr. Jones has been canceled, punished for statements that are related to this case. Statements we don't dispute were wrong. But in order to render a just verdict, you need to understand and be able to see all the evidence and understand the chain of events and understand what he said and when he said it. I'm going to take my time and I promise not to go on for too long. <coughs> to first tell you a little bit about this case, go through a timeline of events, and then lay out why we believe the evidence will show that we should receive your verdict. On December 14th, 2012, <coughs> Adam Lanza, a mentally disturbed young man in Connecticut woke up early. He got a 22 caliber bolt action rifle, <coughs> went to his mother's room, and shot her in the head while she was sleeping. He then armed himself with a long gun and two pistols, and some reports say he drove by the high school where he'd been a student saw two police cars, and diverted to the elementary school. He shot his way in and killed 20 first graders, six-year-olds, and six school employees. In the span of 10 minutes, he created pain that would last a lifetime. Alex Jones was 1,500 miles away in Austin, Texas, dropping off his own six-year-old at school. When he heard <coughs> about the event, he was shocked and saddened, just like everyone else in America. He was also suspicious. Alex Jones has hosted a show called InfoWars since the late 1990s. He started out on Austin Public Access. InfoWars is a talk show where Alex Jones discusses, and, and some of the people who work with him, discuss conspiracy theories. <clears throat> and they discuss government cover-ups. And they discuss lies told by the mainstream media. And they try to give an alternative view. Mostly it's a call-in show. So let's discuss what happened and go through the years. I want to clarify something. Because you're going to watch the videos. The videos are the most important part of this. Not cherry-picking little snippets, but actually watching the videos. And I hope you hold the plaintiffs accountable you're going to hear that Alex Jones was concerned about the government's response on the day of Sandy Hook. You're going to hear that he suspected the government, that he thought 
the government might have been involved. You are not going to hear him say that he didn't think any kids were killed at any time in 2012 or 2013, okay? So when you watch those videos, and watch them, when he says staged an attack, he means they committed an attack, okay? When he says false flag, he means the government attacked its own citizens to try and achieve a political end. Alex Jones doesn't trust the government. Millions of Americans don't trust the government. So let's talk about 2012. And the first thing I want to talk about is what happened in the immediate aftermath of the Sandy Hook murders. There was, and you'll, you'll see Alex, you'll be able to watch his response to it. Like him, everyone was heartbroken across the nation and across the world. And they showed their sympathy for the people of Newtown, Connecticut. You will hear from the witness stand, there were over 500,000 letters, cards, drawings. There were so many toys sent to the town because it had happened right around Christmas. So many toys sent around the town that they had to get a separate they had to get a separate mail sorting facility to distribute the toys to other places. Millions of dollars went to the United Way to support the family members. President Obama got on a jet and flew there the next day. I mean, not to mention every senator from Connecticut, every mayor, uh, every town politician, people from around the world gathered to mourn. The mainstream media also went. Unfortunately, mainstream media went. Some of the people who went to Sandy Hook, and the evidence is going to show that Sandy Hook wasn't different from any other school shooting. I mean, we live in a nation divided. If you're blue, every time there's a school shooting, it's America is the most dangerous place in the world, and we need to ban the AR. And if you're red, every time there's a school shooting, it's, again, here they are, taking advantage of a tragedy to try and infringe upon our rights. Unfortunately, that's just the way things work in this country. And it was no different at Sandy Hook. Hours after the event, CNN, every major news source was there, <coughs> interviewing people, broadcasting, the evidence is going to show calling for gun legislation. Infowars, back in Austin, was also covering it in 2012 and 2013. It was big news. And Infowars never contested that the children were murdered in 2012 or 2013. You'll watch the videos. I, I, I was, frankly, I was surprised. I don't have them ready to play. You'll watch them, okay? Assess them yourself. They were covering it, and they were saying that it was being botched, mishandled, and used to push gun legislation. And you'll hear from the witness stand, they will admit to you that the investigation and the coverage of the event was botched at first. I mean, I don't know what we have now. There's an enormous report. But you will hear covered that CNN misidentified the shooter and put this man's picture up from Hoboken, New Jersey for four hours and said that he was the real killer. You will hear that there was another, well, at least they reported 
that there was another man in handcuffs outside. You will hear that it was reported, and you'll see it in the videos, that there were people who were arrested. There was chaos. And we all know that that's what happens after these events, okay? Unfortunately, in this case, the chaos, the bad coverage, led a lot of people to doubt. People who became known as truthers or the truth community. These were hundreds or even thousands of Americans who got together on Facebook and on Twitter and on YouTube and discussed the event and pointed out what they saw as inconsistencies in it that they believed suggested that there was a cover-up, that the government wasn't being forthright about what had happened. Okay? And some of these people are very, very extreme. Okay? They are. I want to mention four people in particular because they were <coughs> leading members of the truth community. All right? They were all over YouTube. And you'll hear that some of the videos they made got 10 million views. This was big news. And InfoWars was covering it, was covering the questions that people had. Because InfoWars believes in people's right to question information. And they were interviewing these people and saying, hey, you have questions about Sandy Hook. What are they? Okay? Now, there did come a time when Alex was taken in, right? And did become for a time, one of those people. We're not hiding that. But it wasn't in 2012 and it wasn't in 2013. The four people are Dr. James Fetzer, who was a professor at the University of Minnesota at the time. Dr. James Tracy, who was a professor at Atlantic Florida University of Media Studies at the time. Wolfgang Halbig, who you'll see, who was a Florida State Trooper, who did work for the Seminole County Education Board, and who claimed to be a school safety expert who had been interviewed on multiple channels and had even testified before Congress. Some of that now, 2020 hindsight, I don't think is true, okay? But he presented himself that way at the time. And if you understand the news cycle and how it works, commentators, people on talk shows, they get information, they run with it. Alex Jones was wrong to believe these people. But he didn't do it out of spite. The evidence will show that he did it because he believed it, because he thought it was important coverage, because he thought that these people had a right to say what they were doing, that a citizen has a right to get on InfoWars and talk about what their questions are. So let's talk about the bad facts. I mean, we talked about brutal honesty. Twenty fourteen to twenty fifteen in the summer. Alex Jones has apologized repeatedly for the coverage that he gave to Sandy Hook. 2014 to the summer of 2015. And he has every reason to. He does. They trusted people that they shouldn't have trusted. It created a lot of tension at his company. There were arguments about it. But he felt the show was important, and he aired it. He regrets that now, and he said so. 
The thing you have to remember about Alex is that he has been talking about conspiracy theories and taking on the elites, whether that is the Bush administration or the Obama administration or the Clinton administration. He's been the outsider for a really long time. And by the time we get to 2014 and 2015, he felt he had seen what he perceived as so many lies and so many cover-ups and so much hand-washing of the facts that he had become biased. He was looking at the world through dirty glasses. And if you look at the world through dirty glasses, everything you see is dirty. Important for you to know, I don't think there's any evidence that is going to come from that witness stand that Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis ever watched this show during this period. And I can assure you that there will be no evidence that Mr. Jones or any member of his staff named Mr. Heslin or Ms. Lewis during this time. Okay. So just to recap where we are, 2012-2013, InfoWars is covering Sandy Hook with a slant that children were really murdered, but there's a government cover-up and potentially government involvement. That doesn't say that Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis aren't the parents of a dead child. It doesn't. So we get to this period, and it ends in July. And after July, we have quiet from InfoWars on this topic. Yeah. I would object for the reasons we just discussed with the motion so they declare that InfoWars was quiet from July until whenever I am free to discuss what I believe the evidence will show, Your Honor. You are free to discuss what the evidence will show, but liability has been established in this case, and you are close to the edge on that. So please be more careful. Let's talk about 2016. It was an election year. It was a very contested election. <laughs> And Mr. Jones, for the first time in his entire career, supported a candidate. And he was associated with Donald Trump. <coughs> Hillary saw that as a liability for Trump and made Alex a big part of her campaign, saying that Alex had repeatedly said on his show that Sandy Hook hadn't happened. By this point, Alex didn't believe that. So on November 18th, 2016, he put out a video called Final Statement on Sandy Hook. And you'll have the opportunity to watch that video. And I think you should insist on watching that video in its totality, just like every video that's going to come into evidence. Because only then can you understand what really happened. You can't cherry pick. And he said, I want to reach out to the victims of criminal crimes and listeners to clarify where I stand on Sandy Hook. The last three or four years, the mainstream media has made attacks against me that I said no one died. I've hosted debates with both sides of the aisles. I've always said I'm not really sure of what happened. I can see based on the evidence why people might say nobody died, but I don't know what happened. I know mass shootings happen. The official story, however, of Sandy Hook has more holes in it than Swiss cheese. And he still believes that. That's it. Only statement on Sandy Hook for the whole year.
Megyn Kelly is no friend to Donald Trump. And she decided that she was going to run a hit piece on Alex Jones about this issue. Alex Jones hadn't brought it up since November. She brought it up. She decided to air a show where she would confront Alex, who she got to interview by misrepresenting the purpose of the story, and juxtapose it with an interview with Mr. Heslin. <coughs> Alex had never said Mr. Heslin's name. He'd never said Miss Lewis's name. The show is about to air. And before it airs, Alex says, I, I need to clear the air because this is going to misrepresent me. And he says, in a piece, I believe children died there. So the show airs, and afterwards, a young reporter at InfoWars sees an article on a website called Zero Hedge. And that article is in evidence. And the judge has already found InfoWars or Free Speech Systems, parent company for InfoWars, and Alex Jones guilty for those statements. But you are free to consider the intent with which they were made in determining whether they were made maliciously or in good faith. And you're going to hear from the reporter who made the statements. Your Honor, I'm going to have to object again. <laughs> so you're going to have to explain the difference between defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Intentional infliction of emotional distress for which Alex Jones and Free Speech Systems LLC have already been found liable includes the state of mind of the actor which means it has already been established that the acts they took to inflict the emotional distress were intentional. Defamation does not include that in the same way. So you're going to have to clarify that if you're going to go down that path. I, I think the court has already clarified. This is the article. It's in evidence. And basically, the article, you'll have it. You can read it. You know, you can fact check me. But basically the article says that Megyn Kelly isn't doing a good job fact-checking her sources because she didn't run down a seeming inconsistency between what the coroner said about the parents not being brought into contact with the bodies on the day of the shooting and what Mr. Heslin said about holding his child on the day of the shooting. And Interestingly, it states, Alex Jones' official position is that he believes children die in the shooting. In fact, during a 2014 account of a hearing before the Newtown Board of Education, an InfoWars journalist did not dispute that Adam Lanza had perpetrated the shooting. There are four big reasons why I'm going to come back to you at the end of this case and ask for your verdict. The first reason is because when you look at the totality of the coverage, the evidence will be that InfoWars' coverage of the Sandy Hook incident between 2012 and 2018 was less than one half of one percent of its total coverage. It was barely no. 27 hours. I can object again to this entire environment. He, he can say this. He's got to show it. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Less than one half. And remember rule number one, the lawyer who lies deserves to, rule, to lose. OK? 
okay? Less than one half of 1% of total coverage on the show. Okay. And important to add to that is remember, you got CNN and Fox and, and every other newscast covering this issue, right? Especially back in 2013. And InfoWars is a, is a whisper in a hurricane. Point number two. The Sandy, the no one died at Sandy Hook lie did not begin with Mr. Jones. It began with Fetzer and Tracy and Halbig and a guy named Steve Pachenik, who was a former State Department official and a psychiatrist. They were four of the most prominent among thousands of people who were saying this on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. Given that, it brings me to point number three. You are still allowed to decide how much damage Alex Jones caused. And in doing so, you can assess whether his words made their way to the ears of the plaintiffs. You can assess whether anybody was moved to act by anything that Alex Jones said. And the evidence will show that he did not cause the harassment. Number four, Mr. Bankston, the personal injury lawyer, talked about this a little bit. Actual damages. The first question you're going to be asked to answer is actual damages. You will see no evidence that it was Alex Jones, the talk show host, and not Adam Lanza, the mass murderer, that caused the mental anguish that is honestly suffered by Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis. The videos are so important. I want to, before I sit down, I want to make a couple more points. Number one, Alex Jones has apologized repeatedly for what he said. And I expect he'll do so again here. Alex Jones has already been punished. He, because of this case, he lost all his access to the internet. Millions of dollars canceled. He regrets what he did. And he's paying a price for it. He's paying a price for it today. He pays a price for it every time somebody on the street chases him and says, you killed the children at Sandy Hook, and throws coffee on him. And because he's been canceled, nobody can hear his side of the story. Nobody can see the texture of reality. We are not cardboard cutouts. We are all real complex people. People make mistakes. They pay for them. They want to tell you this is the great Satan. This man is not a cardboard cutout. 
He's a human being just like every one of us with his own ideas. You will be able to decide. And I want you to ask yourself at the end of this case, is this an honest attempt by personal injury lawyers to get just compensation for damages that were actually experienced? Or is this a cynical attempt by personal injury lawyers to enrich themselves while silencing a political opponent and limiting every American's right to choose what they watch and what they listen to. I look forward to presenting this case to you. All right, thank you, Mr. Raynal. Before we break, I see people with gum in their mouth. It's clearly stated on the door. There is no eating. There is no gum in this courtroom. If I see it again, I'll stop. I'm talking, sir. The, the number one rule in court, fair or not, is when the judge is talking, nobody else is, even if I interrupt someone. Except for me, because I've got the pause button. Sorry to interrupt again, but does this judge remind you of the worst substitute teacher you've ever had, or what? There is no chewing gum. There is no soda. There is no eating in this courtroom. If I see it again, I'll have you removed. There is no recording of any kind of the YouTube feed or the proceedings in this courtroom without prior written permission signed by me. No photographs, no audio recording, no video recording. So I'm not taking away everyone's phones in the room but if we find out that you're doing one of those things, you will be removed. There is no um, talking to, talking in front of, or approaching by anyone of my jury. If somebody does that in the courthouse, they will be removed until this trial is over. Just want to make that very clear to everyone. We're going to break for lunch. It's noon. We're going to break until 1.30. My jury can go ahead and head on out. Do the lawyers need me right now? All right, Mr. Reynolds. Um, first on, on the United Way, it was certainly not my intent. I think I said that the United Way received millions of dollars in donations to support the parents and the families of Sandy Hook. I don't think that's collateral source. I mean, I think that's what the evidence will be, that the United Way took in all that money. I, I certainly didn't mean to insinuate that they turned around and gave it to Mr. Hessel and Ms. Lewis. Uh, and I think it's easily covered in the testimony. The money came in. It was spent on all sorts of things. Uh, I'm not going to get into this, but there's lots of allegations that it was misspent on other things by the United Way. I'm not really sure what relevance it has to this case at all. I think it's relevant because part of... The, we expect to hear from the plaintiffs that Mr. Jones' statements were hurtful to them um, because it, it negated their experience, their tragedy, uh, the loss of their child. And we believe they're going to have an expert who's going to test them. We think that the fact that the, the whole community was supported throughout this period by everyone is relevant to the determination of to what extent they felt supported, to what extent the diagnosis, which is based on, on being negated, um, is relevant. So they're going to call an expert, and I expect that the expert's going to use examples and say, you know, when, when somebody has their experience of trauma negated, it re-victimizes them. Um, that might very well be true in the case of, of a sexual assault or something where you reach out to an authority figure and the person says, eh, I don't believe you that you were raped or raised. But our case is distinguishable. Uh, there was tremendous outpouring of support for the families um, to help them heal. And that's relevant to the amount of mental anguish that they suffer. Your Honor, I would just like to say that if he felt that a collateral source issue of benefits was relevant. 
He was obligated under the standing order to approach the court and secure a ruling before putting it in front of this jury. This jury has now been poisoned to think that these plaintiffs have been part of the recipients of millions of dollars, which is exactly what Mr. Jones said he was going to do and why we brought the motion. And they just did it anyway. Mm -hmm. if, if I were going to violate Your Honor's ruling, which I certainly did not intend to, uh, it wouldn't be in a two-second throwaway comment after saying they got cards, flowers, toys, and charities. All right, what's the rest of your response? Um, the uh, issue of net worth, I said nothing about Mr. Jones's net worth. Uh, Mr. Bankston made the platforming part of his opening statement. Um, to say somebody has lost millions of dollars doesn't say anything about it. I mean, deplatforming, he, he brought that into this trial, right? And there are consequences to the platform that are painfully obvious, and one of them is loss of revenue. Your Honor, my response to that is he only, not only said he lost millions, but tied that into saying he lost everything and has already been punished. Uh, these comments were clearly to imply evidence of net worth. That's what our motion is on. By putting this into the trial, the only way I could rebut it is, for instance, putting in the amount of revenues for the years that he listed up there. When he said, oh, 2016, he lost, you know, years that he mm -hmm. lost these millions. I've got it. We have evidence of what his revenues were, and they're $165 million over a couple of years. And this jury here is getting the idea that he's destitute, which is going to prejudice their, their punitive, their compensatory damages because they're going to say he can't get blood from his stomach. And this has radically reshaped this trial now because this jury has been given a story of this that they should have sympathy for Jones because he has lost so much and now he has lost everything. Those millions of dollars really affect us. If, if, if we're bound for the rest of the trial on that, this jury is not going to return a correct verdict. Yeah, man. How is this personal injury lawyer supposed to make a living if he can't take all of Jones's money? Poor little fella. And then on the uh, apology? Uh, with the million... Bucks first, Your Honor, or the apology? No, you already you already responded to his argument. No, no, the, the, the sanction, the million dollar sanction. Oh, so, sure, he's going to address that one too. The Court of Appeals, I think, revert, uh, Court of Appeals denied our motion on a Friday. The sanction was due on Monday. I had a check overnighted from InfoWars um, for what I believe to be the correct amount is $966,000. Put on it the names of all the plaintiffs, oh, I instructed my client, his father, particularly to put on it the name of the law firm and the name of the plaintiffs, and had it delivered to their offices. Instead of cashing it and saying, you owe me another 100 grand, uh, Mr. Bankston called me and said, you know, the check's not legible, it's for the wrong amount, um, reissue me a new check. Okay, so I called my client and they are putting a stop payment on the old check, I think they already have, and they're coming up, they're going to do a new check that has everything typed on it. I thought I was going to have it today, I'm sure I'll have it tomorrow. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, there's lots of good faith. Nine hundred sixty-six thousand dollars is not peanuts, and Mr. Banks could have cashed the check and said you only have hundred. Your Honor could not have cashed the check. Did uh, you try? The check was no sidebars. The check was completely illegible. I can show that to you if you like. It was written to the wrong clients. I cannot take money from this from these plaintiffs that is owed to them. I don't know why the check content. would be written other to anyone other than the attorneys, and to go into their account and then be dispersed properly. That's the way we do things like this. It's always written to the attorneys. Look, the aw shucks, I just made a mistake, I don't know quite what I'm doing, enough of that, okay? You know exactly what you're doing, you're very competent. I don't appreciate you pretending to not be. Get the check here tomorrow, made out to Mr. Bankston's law firm, in the correct amount. If you don't know what the correct amount is, send Mr. Bankston an email and ask him what it is. If you disagree with his response, let me know before we leave today, and we will have a conversation about it. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't want to open up the whole trial with regard to net worth, because we, we went through that a week ago. What I heard Mr. Reynal say was InfoWars lost everything. Now, I know 
Alex Jones is InfoWars, and InfoWars is Alex Jones. That's been established in this case. The same goes for free speech systems. Um, but I don't, I don't know that we need to completely open up net worth to address that. But I do think it means you're going to get a little more leeway to talk about those subjects. You can respond um, to the United Way by asking, I guess, asking your clients if they got any. I mean, I don't know the answer to any of these things. So you can talk to me. I'm not going to make a decision on that without knowing a little bit more about it. Let's put it that way. We might need to have a conference about that. But I don't know, I don't know enough about the facts on that. I do not see in your answer anywhere that you plead 73003 3, A3. Here are the many of the apologies are contained in the videos that are running in that That that's fine, but that's not that's not how you make an affirmative defense on damages. You have to plead it. You didn't plead it. You've are already argued in your statement to the jury that he's been punished and shouldn't be punished more because he's apologized. So what am I supposed to do with that now? You weren't allowed to do that. So this statement I'm being asked to read to the jury. Mr. Raynal threw out his opening statements, claimed that Mr. Jones has, quote, apologized repeatedly, unquote, for the statements he made against the plaintiffs. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this statement is hereby stricken from the record, and you are to disregard this statement as it has no evidentiary value in this case. Any public apology, correction, or retraction of the libelous matter made and published by the defendant, Alex Jones, did you want to include free speech systems? Sure, the, that's just your own. I mean, sure, just for the clarity for the jury. Yes. May not be considered as evidence of mitigation damages in this matter for Texas law. Can, can I ask the court a question? I don't think so. Okay, just. <clears throat> you can write a note to your co counsel, but it's one attorney per proceeding, section, argument, witness. Thank you. I, I mean, I think that this proposed statement is true and accurate. Um, I'm willing to add <clears throat> that, as a reminder, what the lawyers told you in their opening statements is not evidence. It's their expectation of what the evidence will show. Um, I think I would add that before the statement proposed by Mr. Bankston to provide a little context for it and not after when it might be misconstrued as contradicting what I had just read them. I would rather not draw more attention to it, I'd find the statement as produced by Mr. Bankston. You're fine with the statement as produced by Mr. Bankston? Yes. All right. Then I will read that. <coughs> Any other motions? Uh, I you're deal with all of them, except for the one that I'm thinking exactly, about? Exactly. Uh, the only other thing I would ask you alternatively, Your Honor, is if we're not going to open up um, bifurcation. I know you told me you have some leeway on this issue. Mm -hmm. the, thing, the thing that I think I would like to do is not try to introduce net worth or expert opinion on that, but simply introduce the evidence, the revenue information that we have through a witness so that we can show that the loss of millions is counterbalanced by 165 million coming in. And then what are we doing in the second part of the trial? It's right, all yeah, have to, right, I hear what you're saying, but I'm only just going to put on the revenue. And so in the, in the second part of the trial, I'm going to put on an expert for net worth, and he's going to have to extrapolate from what limited data we have and his own expert background to establish from both revenues and from what people's operating expenses should be, what today the net worth of the company should be. This would be more of an argument about what the revenue of the company was at the time Mr. Raynaud has implied that the company was losing millions. Um. Is any of that going to be necessary today? I don't think I could make it not. I have a witness who might come on today who I might be the person I want to do that through, but it could be handled tomorrow. Okay, because okay, what I'm going to do is read the transcript. Okay. Um, for both of those issues, actually. Was there any other motion, Mr. Bankston? No, Your Honor. That's all from the plaintiffs. Anything from you, Mr. Randall? No, Your Honor. Um, I was expecting something else, so we're not dealing with that. Oh, if you wanted to go back in chambers and deal with that, yes, we can. Is there something you're planning to ask me to do? Or you yeah. just want me to know about it? It's, yeah, it doesn't need to be on camera. 
I understand, right. but um, yes, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm not sure if you're going to do it or if you do something else. Okay, but yes, I do have a specific request. All right, well, we'll take that up later. I don't, okay. I don't want to make the jury wait longer. Um, all right, we are ready to bring the jury back. Yes. All right, yes, Mrs. Maddox, right. feel we're ready to bring the jury back. All right. All right, you may be seated. I'll let Ms. Matichick get through. <laughs> All, right. All right, welcome back from lunch. I do have a quick um, statement that I'm going to read for my jury, and then we'll turn to um, the plaintiff's side for their first witness and some other things. Mr. Raynell, throughout his opening statements, claimed that Mr. Jones has apologized repeatedly for the statements he made against the plaintiffs. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this statement is hereby stricken from the record, and you are to disregard those statements as it has no evidentiary value in this case. Any public apology, correction, or retraction of the libelous matter made and published by the defendants Alex Jones or Free Speech Systems LLC may not be considered as evidence of mitigation of damages in this matter per Texas law. All right, now we're ready to begin again. It looks like we've had a little uh, council change there. So, Mr. Ball, do you have a witness for me? Mr. I do, Your, I do, Your Honor. Okay. Please call Detective Dan Jewis in the same place. All right, thank you. Detective, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm going to skip most of this guy's testimony, and I realize a lot of folks won't be happy about that, but this is the head detective on Sandy Hook. And most of the testimony is about whether or not Sandy Hook actually happened or not. We already know that it did, and that isn't even what this trial is about anyway. But if you think it was staged, you can go to csp.sandyhookreport.ct.gov and look for yourself. I would post a link, but YouTube doesn't let me do that anymore. So you'll have to jot it down, man. This detective complained that there were thousands of FOIA requests, and they couldn't keep up. So they created the website to post them all publicly instead of sending out each request, one by one. If this was our standard procedure for high-profile cases like this one, conspiracy theories wouldn't hold much weight unless they were true. And so we decided that by us actually just publicly releasing it all and having it be on our website where any fact checker could simply go to it to include the families, then it would be more difficult for somebody to spin that up and misinterpret it and, and own that power. So uh, that site has everything that was not redacted through FOIA was released there. So that is thousands of reports under numerous case numbers associated with Sandy Hook. It is uh, photos, videos, everything associated with our case that was released under those FOIA requests. Every investigation should have a website like that. We pay for all these investigations and then they seal everything up and no one learns anything and then people have to fill in the gaps on their own. Therefore, conspiracy theories exist. If you ask me what this man's greatest accomplishment was, I'd say setting up that website. But if you ask the defense attorneys the same question, I bet they'd say it's his ability to cry on demand. Why was it important for you today, detective, to be present here and offer us your testimony? To me, it still goes back to that number one thing that we wrote on the butcher block, and that is that it's still our job to support those families in every way possible. And it's absolutely horrific, the amount of trauma that they've had to endure in the wake of having lost a loved one. Other than the shooter himself. Your Honor, I object to this part of the testimony. I understand that Mr. Jewis is emotionally involved here, but he's not a psychiatrist, he's not a doctor. He doesn't have personal knowledge of 
their trauma in any way that could be helpful to the jury. Yeah, I object to the speech. All right, overruled. I think he's already testified that he does have personal knowledge. Even though the objection was overruled, Renault was still able to break his concentration, so the tears never came. Later on, during cross-examination, things finally started getting interesting. Do you consider the body of the victim to be an important piece of evidence in a murder? Absolutely. And is it important for that that body, that, that person, to be handled only by professionals until he or she is released to a funeral? The, the, the first priority is actually trying to provide medical attention and save lives or stop the threat. So before we get to any investigative stuff, the, the top concern is that. Objection, so non-responsive. Overruled. So if the body is handled because of those things, then those are a higher priority. After that, though, the scene should absolutely be secured and processing the scene should be the top priority. Okay, and, and that's what I want to ask. I want you to assume that, that this person is, is deceased and you're processing the scene. And so it's important that only professionals handle the body of the deceased until it's released to the, the funeral director. Correct. Now, um, if uh, a <coughs> non-professional uh, handled uh, the body of one of the children at the crime scene. Somebody who was not in the police, who was not a medical examiner. Would that be important to you? To know that? Do you mean other than s somebody else in that s school? I'm, yeah, I'm saying if there, if, there was, if there was, well, let me ask it this way. <coughs> Are you aware that Mr. Heslin has said that some member of law enforcement allowed him access to his son at the medical examiner's tent outside the school so that he could hold the body? No. Okay. Would that, in, in, in terms of preserving evidence in the most significant crime scene in Connecticut and potentially nationwide history, would it be Important to you as the investigator to know that a victim's parent, probably good stuff, but went in and handled one of the bodies before it had been uh, autopsied and released to the family. Your Honor, object to the relevance of this. We are literally getting into the exact opposite of what has been said by Alex Jones and his crew, so I can't understand the relevance of this in any way. Your Honor, I think it is very relevant to the state of, of mind of the InfoWars broadcast. Your Honor has ruled that a reason, I, I assume that Your Honor has ruled that somebody watching that broadcast would interpret that Mr. Shore was saying that Mr. Heslin was, was lying. And I'm not arguing with that, Judge. You've made that decision, okay? And I'm not trying to go against your decision. What I am saying is that we should be allowed to offer that, in fact, what was intended was to dispute the quality of the investigation. And maybe you are, but not this way, sustained. Fair to say that in the aftermath of the shooting, the news media, the national news media, made incorrect statements about what had happened at Sandy Hook. Yes. And fair to say that the national news media misidentified who the shooter was. Isn't it true that CNN put up a pho photograph of some somebody other than Adam Lanza and identified them as the shooter? Correct. And I don't know if it was local news media or national news media, but at, at first there were reports that a second person was in custody <coughs> because of the attack. Isn't that true? I don't know if the reports were that it was because of the attack as opposed to that there was somebody else that was detained. I, okay. Around that time, I, I was obviously busy with things. I don't know exactly what the media reports were. Fair enough. You said earlier, in response to a question by Mr. Ball, <coughs> that um, 
Wolfgang Halbig was uh, closely connected to Mr. Jones. Do you recall that testimony? I believe that's the wording I used. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, and by that I take it you mean that he appeared on his show? I do. Yes. Okay. You're certainly not telling this jury that he was ever an employee of Infowars, are you? No, that I, do, I don't know. Pass the word. Right. about 10 minutes before the break. That man, Wolfgang Halbig, that's closely connected to Alex Jones, you're personally aware of emails and communications sent to you by Ms. Lewis as it concerned his harassment, continued harassment of her and her family, correct? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> this whole thought about that CNN put the wrong picture of someone up and it reported incorrectly who the shooter was. That was Adam Lanza's brother. Picture of him, right? Because Adam Lanza had his brother's ID, right? Correct. Yeah. What object to the leading, Your Honor? Um, okay. I can, I can rephrase. That's fine. Thank you. The picture that defense counsel here talked to you about as the wrong shooter. Remember that? I do, yes. Yeah, who was that the picture of? It was his older brother. It was Adam Lanza's older brother, Ryan. Still dealing in misinformation, are we? Objection to the sidebar, Your Honor. Sustained. Unless you meant that as a real question. I did. Still dealing in misinformation, aren't we? Today, in this courtroom. But it wasn't the shooter. It was his brother. So apparently that makes it okay. I'm going to object to the sidebar again, Your Honor. I, but I'll, I'll take it back up on recross. Um... I don't know that it's a sidebar, but I'm going to ask you to move on to another question. Fair enough. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Is it in any way okay to identify somebody's older brother as a mass murderer on the nightly news? I don't know how that initial information got to the press. I understand, but I mean, as you sit here today, do you think that that's something that um, somebody could get sued over on the, the press side for, for putting out the wrong person's picture and saying this person just killed 20 children in Newtown? I don't know. Object objection, Your Honor. I don't think he's a legal expert on Sustained. how that comes to be. Yeah. When you say specifically targeted, you're, again, we're talking about Wolfgang Halbig, right? Which well, question the, the, the are you that, to? That it, I, I'm not suggesting this isn't the truth, but when we're talking about Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis <coughs> being harassed, you're talking specifically about Mr. Halbig, aren't you? He is one of the people. Okay, but who else harassed them? Well, I believe by what we just saw in the opening statements that Alex um, Jones... Well, let me um, stop here. Let me stop everyone. You may be asked questions about which you don't actually have knowledge. It is okay to say, I don't know the answer to that. It's not your fault. It's probably the lawyers trying to get something out and seeing what will happen. That's a lawyer thing. Not bad. I used to do it all the time. Just the way lawyers are. So I, I'm just saying, you listen to the question, and you tell us what your answer is. If you have an answer, if you don't have an answer, we want that's what we want to know. So the question was, who else are harassed them? I can ask a better question. All right. As you sit here today, the only person that you know of that has specifically sought them out by email, telephone, or, or other medium based on your investigation and being a police officer in Connecticut and not based on anything you've seen in court today is Mr. Wolfgang Halby. Isn't that true? I don't, I don't know that. I'm not sure. I... That's fair. But you can't offer anybody else as you say. Hate to put well, you on the spot. Well, as I sit here today, I know that Alex Jones talked about Neil Hessen's 
interview with Megyn Kelly. And so I would say that that is uh, a public harassment of that because that information is incorrect. Understood, and that's what that's what we watch on the television. That was the, the broadcast. Correct. No further questions. All right. Thank you. So I'm not familiar with this kind of thing, but in this trial, the jury is allowed to ask written questions for the witnesses. It's pretty interesting. So what happens now, detective and jury, is I'm going to read you some questions, and you just answer them to the jury, just like they had come from one of the lawyers. Okay. And to the jury, thank you. Um, some of you may not hear a question you proposed, or it may be slightly rewritten. You can put all of that on me. These are my decisions. I decide what the questions will be at this stage. Um, and so if you're frustrated by that, at the end of this process, I'll be meaning the end of the process, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, until then, just assume that I have a good reason for the decision I made, all right? Okay, here are the questions. How many hours or days after the shooting did you first see the scene of the crime as a police officer and as an investigator? It was one week after Sandy Hook that I went to the scene and with my team we then did a walkthrough of the scene. In your experience and observation, did Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis experience greater trauma from the harassment calls and emails? Has greater trauma than one. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> just, no. That is one flaw. We don't go back and forth. It's just you just do the best you can with the question the way it's written. And if you can't or you don't understand it, you're free to tell us that as well. I find it hard to even put myself in the shoes of a family member who's lost a loved one in this situation, especially being a parent who's lost a young child. Objection on responsibility. Um, so let me just read the question one more time. And if it doesn't work, it's OK. You can just tell us that. In your experience and observation, did Mr. Heslin and Ms. Lewis ex experience greater trauma from the harassment, the calls, and emails? So I believe that experiencing that harassment on top of that unbearable is I, I can't even imagine, but absolutely, I do believe that it is, it is greater and it's uh, extended it. It's, it makes it so, so much longer lasting. In the aftermath of a school shooting, what, if anything, brings the most solace to a mourning family? I have found that that's uh, individual for each one of them. Some is faith, some is just their own family and friends. When we look at it from the law enforcement side about what we can provide to help with that is I believe it's our responsibility to provide them the truth. As, as harsh as that truth may be sometimes is that it's what we can do is fill in as many facts as possible because otherwise we find that victims will have some type of script of how things went in their mind and that they'll actually make, they'll imagine that it's more horrific than anything actually could be. And so our responsibility is to provide them with every detail that we're able to do. The information you discussed is available through the Freedom of Information Act. When was the information available for viewing on the department's website? I believe it was that beginning portion of, of 2014. I, I know it was after we, we initially suspended our investigation the first time, which was one year afterwards. I, I could be wrong, it could be this, the December 2013, it could be much later in 2014, but I do believe it was, it was the beginning of 2014. Was the information available incrementally as it was created or all at one time at the conclusion of the investigation? Some information was put out through briefings through our PIO and, and other forms, but as far as the release of those reports and those photos and everything that we saw in, I believe, Exhibit 27, that was all released all at once. So whenever what that release was, that happened all at once. And then if 
then if there was any other follow-up reports, because the case was open and closed with some some minor stuff after that, that was continuously redacted through FOIA, and then the site was updated with that new information. So incrementally, got it. Do you know how the other families are dealing with their loss? Again, I found that that's very much an in, in individual, not just by family, but by family members, and that that has changed and progressed over time. It's one of the things that that our consultant, uh, Dr. Balboni, who is a psychologist, educated us on was the different stages of grief and how we should expect these different family members to go through all those stages over time. And because they each experienced their loss in different ways, we saw them as individuals of this whole group really progress through that. Some, I believe, are much farther along in that process and some um, still have a long way to go in that process. Thank you so much, Detective. That concludes your testimony at this stage, and you may um, exit the witness stand. Thank you so much for your time and your testimony. We greatly appreciate it, and you are free to go. All right. Do you have another witness for us? Your Honor, the plaintiffs will call Daria Karpova at this time. All right. Do you mind? Thank you, Detective uh, Deputy. All right, good afternoon, Ms. Rafova. Good afternoon. Um, can you tell the jury, uh, first, can you identify yourself for the record? Sorry, Rafova. You are an InfoWars producer? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to talk first a little bit about your background before InfoWars. Um, can you tell me where you grew up? Um, I grew up in St. Petersburg, Russia, and then in New York City. Okay, can you tell us where you went to um, for your secondary education? I went to Expression College for Digital Arts, which is in California. Okay, and I am going to assume that you have experience in video production. Yes, sir. Okay. And you've been doing that at InfoWars, correct? Uh, uh, partially. Okay, and you have other jobs at InfoWars, correct? Yes. Okay. You have worked with Mr. Jones since 2015, is that right? You have managerial authority over production employees inside InfoWars. Is that correct? Objection to the vagueness managerial authority. I don't know what that means. Overall, if you don't know what a question means, Ms. Carpola, you can say that. But otherwise, if you do, you can answer the question. As of um, in my current position, I do. Now, when you're working with Mr. Jones and you're doing work for InfoWars as a producer, Am I correct that you were employed by his company, Free Speech Systems, LLC? Yes, I am. Okay. You were, isn't it correct, selected to act as a corporate representative of that company in this case, correct? Yes, I was. As part of that selection, you have previously provided testimony on behalf of the corporation, correct? Yes, I was. And when I say on behalf of the corporation, you gave testimony in which you prepared to speak with the corporation's voice, correct? Yes. As part of the preparation for doing that, you were tasked with making yourself acquainted with several topics of information that relate to this case, correct? <coughs> yes. One of those that you have made your, you have had to, were ordered to prepare yourself on for that testimony was an examination of the videos that are contained in plaintiff's lawsuit, correct? I don't believe that's true. Okay, do you remember uh, giving a deposition yes, on sir. December 3rd, 2021? Yes, sir. Do you remember if one of those topics in that petition to research was the videos in plaintiff's petition in their lawsuit? I don't remember that exact phrasing for videos, I think the question, the topic was a more generalized question that I remember. When you prepared yourself to testify about InfoWars, one of the things you did was talk to other people inside of InfoWars about the events of this case, correct? Are you referring to the current testimony? Or Not the, no ma'am, actually let's 
focus back on your 2021 testimony, okay, when you prepared yourself to speak on behalf of the company. In preparing to do that, you spoke with people inside of the company about the events of this case, correct? I would say partially yes. Well, I mean, you spoke with Nightly News Director Rob Dew, didn't you? Yes, I did. You, you spoke with Mr. Jones? I did not speak with Mr. Jones about okay. it. Did you speak with uh, an InfoWars employee named Michael Zimmerman? Yes, I did. Do you remember any of the other people you spoke to? I believe these were the two people that I spoke to. Okay. And in doing that preparation, you also looked at documents inside the company, correct? Uh, yes. In fact, you and I have met before, correct? Yes, sir. And one of the things that we did when we met last time is we looked at some of those documents together, didn't we? Yes, we did. Okay. Another thing that you did when preparing for that testimony was to view InfoWars videos, correct? Yes, I did. Okay. Some of those videos um, that we talked about in your deposition relate to some of the things that are going on in this case, don't they? Yes. I want to talk about, if we go back to, let's, let's, I want to use a, an, a, a date range with you. For these questions, I want to talk about the period between 2012 and 2018. Okay? Now, do you understand sitting here today, 2012, that December was the San Diego shoot. Yes, I understand. Okay, and you understand that Infowars was sued over that over uh, statements made about Mr. Hudson and Mr. Lewis in 2018. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. I want to talk about during those years the different ways you can see Infowars. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is that Mr. Jones does a live show, correct? Yes, he does. In fact, in fact, he's doing it right now. Correct? I'm not sure what he's doing right now. Okay. He had a YouTube. Your Honor, I, I would I would object to lack of foundation that she has personal knowledge of info wars between 2012 and when she began working there in 2015. Uh, she was actually prepared on that for the deposition. That right, I think that's what we're talking about. I, I understand, but I, I think it would be up to Mr. Bankson to elicit what somebody told her. She has no personal knowledge of these, these facts. Well, and she's we're not okay, right now we're talking about her role as a corporate representative. A corporate representative is somebody designated by the corporation and tasked with obtaining all of the knowledge that that corporation has and swearing to it under oath at a deposition or in testimony. So she doesn't have to have worked there if she's been designated as a corporate representative. I believe that's the case, Your Honor, for purposes of the deposition, but right. not for purposes of her testimony here today. Well, I'm not really sure exactly what, we're not there yet, so make it clear. Correct. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm so make it, how she gained this if it's personal knowledge that Ms. Garbova has just as a person, it probably starts when she went to work there, but if it's her knowledge as the corporate representative, then that's something different. Yes, and in fact, I think one thing that would help me make it clear for you, Ms. Karpova, when I ask questions, is I may ask questions that are geared towards your personal opinion and your personal knowledge, or I may ask you what you have been in, have, are, have testified to on behalf of the corporation. Do you understand the difference between those two things? Yes, I okay. do. I want to go back again to your corporate deposition um, and ask you again, um, do you remember in your corporate deposition that you were tasked with certain tasks and one of those, the first topic in fact, was the sourcing and research for the videos in plaintiff's petition. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that topic. Okay. Let's go back again to 2018, to 20, 2012 to 2018. And those videos in Plaintiff's Petition span that entire time period, don't they? Different years on videos, yes. Okay. And during those years in which those videos were put out, and those broadcasts were put out, you would agree with me that they appeared in multiple different formats, correct? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Sure, let's start then. You understand that some of those videos during that time period were aired as part of Mr. Jones's live show, correct? 
I believe some of the videos were taken from the live show. Okay. Another place that some of these videos come from is InfoWars YouTube page, correct? I'm not sure where the videos came from. You don't remember us talking in deposition about YouTube videos? Would you remind me exactly what you're talking about? Um, I, I'll see if I can find that for you, Mr. Let's move on to something else. Um, some of the videos that we're talking about were also carried on a radio show, correct? I'm not sure if the videos were... I don't have personal knowledge of the videos playing on the radio show. I'm one, not sure what you mean by that. One thing you do have personal knowledge of is that Mr. Jones's live show that you can see videoed is simulcast on radio. You understand that, right? Yes. Okay. So, as we know, you testified earlier, some of these come from the live show, right? Correct. So some of them are on radio, weren't they? If those shows were broadcasted on radio, they would have to be, but I'm not sure if they were. Okay. But we do know that Mr. Jones' live show is simulcast on radio, correct? That's something you testified? Typically. You would, would you agree with me, for instance, the InfoWars YouTube page? You would agree with me that that was a source over the course of your career, and I'm asking you personally. Over the course of your career, that's been a significant source of InfoWars views and audience. You would agree with that? I would assume so. Okay. Would you agree with me that those you, that YouTube channel has over a billion views? Um, I'm not sure if I can agree to that because I haven't, I haven't seen the statistics. Okay, so that's fair enough. Let's talk about the InfoWars website, right? Because not the YouTube page, but I want to talk about InfoWars.com. You're familiar with that website? Yes. Okay. Um, the videos discussed in Plaintiff's Petition, many if not all of those videos appeared on the InfoWars.com website, correct? I don't agree with that, no. Okay. Do you agree that some of them were? I'm not sure. Because I'm just, oh, excuse me, please finish your answer. The specific videos in question, um, I would have to look at the archives of InfoWars.com to see if those particular videos were posted to InfoWars.com. You would agree with me that much like the live show is typically simulcast by radio, typically InfoWars videos are hosted after the live show on the InfoWars.com website. You would agree with that? No, I wouldn't. I don't agree with that. You wouldn't agree with me that pretty much every day after Mr. Jones does a show, that there is not only uploaded to InfoWars.com a full video of that day's prior day show, but several clips from that show. You wouldn't agree that that's the typical practice of InfoWars? No, sir. Okay. That website, InfoWars.com, you've reviewed statistics relating to the view count on that website, correct? I have not. Hmm. Do you remember seeing this in your corporate deposition? You reviewed it then? There were a lot of documents there. I don't recall the specific page you're referring to. Okay. Ms. Barkova, I'm going to bring you something here. It's a big document. I only need to see the first page. I'm going to bring you the whole thing. This has been previously admitted as Plaintiff's Exhibit 39. Your Honor, with your permission, I'd like to publish this exhibit to the jury. Sure. And Lisa, can you bring up 39 for me? This is analytics for the InfoWars website, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, you would agree with me at the very top of the... Well, let's start a little bit on this document. These analytics are something that is collected by InfoWars to analyze their business, correct? I can <coughs> confirm that because I'm not responsible for that job. I'm not in the analytics department. I don't know. So you don't know why InfoWars collects stats on how many people view its website? You don't know that? I don't know if it does or why if it, if it did. All right. And on this page, which, as you see here, has a blown up column for page views on the InfoWars website, isn't it true that you agreed with me that there are nearly 3 billion views 
unique page views on the InfoWars website. That's correct? That's what it says. You would agree with me that over the course of your career, from 2015, for instance, during that period, InfoWars was already featured on over 200 radio stations. You know that, right? I don't know the exact number of radio stations. Okay. Ms. Rappo, before your, your role as corporate representative in this case, weren't you asked to prepare to learn all of the company's information about the audience reach of those videos in that plaintiff's petition? I was asked to prepare several topics, and I've consulted with the people that I thought were necessary for that, and I did the best I could collecting that information. Okay, objection on response with Sustained. Ms. Karpova, what I'm asking you, very specifically, is when that, when you were being asked to prepare to testify for the company, to give information for this lawsuit, one of the things that you prepared on was the audience reach of the videos in plaintiff's petition. That's correct? That, I, I disagree with your premise. I can, it, it's very hard to determine the reach of our audience. Objection. Objection on response. All right, sustained. So just listen to the question and just the actual question you're asked, answer that question. Okay, so he's going to tell you one more time. All right, Ms. Karpova. Let's try it. Let me make sure I'm being really clear with you. I'm not asking you right now for what the audience reach was. I'm not asking you if you were able to do it to your satisfaction. I'm not asking you about any of the data you found. I want to know, were you tasked for this case with preparing to testify about what the audience reach of the plaintiff's petition videos were? Yes. You would agree with me that another place that you could see InfoWars videos is social media, correct? Mm, not anymore. Ms. Karpova, do you remember when I asked you about a date range? Yes. Okay, and that was 2012 to 2018, wasn't it? Yes. InfoWars, and let's go past that date just for right now, because I want to make sure we get this really clear. Right. Let's talk about 2018 to the present. You've still been working at InfoWars, right? Yes. InfoWars has a social media account on Parler, doesn't it? Yes. It InfoWars so has a social media account on Gitter, doesn't it? Yes. InfoWars has a social media account on Truth Social currently, correct? Yes. In fact, InfoWars has numerous social media accounts, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Okay. So, let me ask you this. And InfoWars has a burgeoning website. A lot of people come and visit the InfoWars website, even currently. Correct? Again, I don't know the statistics. I mean, InfoWars has a website. Yes, it does. It has access to the internet. Yes. Now, that's, that's something it still has. In fact, there are many InfoWars employees who have social media accounts. Correct. Some of those accounts are on things like Twitter, Facebook, things like that, correct? I'm not sure about uh, Twitter okay. or Facebook. Those places, the company social media accounts, uh, those are places where people can see InfoWars videos from time to time, isn't it? Are we asking about the personal social media accounts or are we asking about the company social media I just media? said the company social media accounts. Correct? You can see videos on the company's social media accounts, correct? The ones that you've um, mentioned okay. other than Facebook and Twitter. Okay, so the company still has social media accounts, correct? Yes. Okay. And the company has a website where you can watch InfoWars videos right now, doesn't it? I believe the website is mostly article-driven. InfoWars.com. If I go to InfoWars.com and I hit ban.video, I'm looking at a huge archive of videos, aren't I? That's updated every single day, right? You've just mentioned a different website. If you go to InfoWars.com, one of the sections of that website, up at the top, with news, featured articles, other stuff, is ban.video. <coughs> Click here for video, isn't it? You're talking about ban.video, but you're asking me about InfoWars.com. All right, let's not split a lot of hairs, then. I'll just make the question a lot bigger for you. The InfoWars.com website provides a link at the very top of the website to another, I guess, 
web domain that is also owned by Mr. Jones and Free Speech Systems that provides video content daily on the internet, correct? Yes. So if somebody were to say that InfoWars has had all of its access to the internet taken away and lost its ability to post on all social media, that would not be true, would it? Not entirely. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Not entirely. That's not an entirely true statement, is it? Right, if someone was to say that, that would not be an entirely true statement. I would say for the most part it is true. Okay, well what I'm asking you is because something I heard earlier today in opening statement is this right here. InfoWars has lost its access to the internet. InfoWars has lost its social media accounts. If those things were said, that's not true, is it? InfoWars has not lost its access to the internet. InfoWars has not lost the entirety of its social media. Correct? I believe it was referring to the audience reach and the, the new social media platforms that have come up since the deplatforming have a fraction of the viewership that the previous platforms did, which Alex is no longer on. Well, let's just talk about what you mean when you say deplatforming, right? Infowars, shortly after the filing of this lawsuit, lost its YouTube page, correct? Yes. And it did so, that happened because of repeated community violation violations of YouTube policy, correct? I don't know that. Okay, you don't know how you, you lost the YouTube site? I object, Your Honor, calls for speculation as to, she obviously doesn't work for YouTube, I mean, it's, it's I, I'm, I don't, okay, your objection calls for speculation is overruled. Okay. She said she doesn't know, you can try to get I'll to it another way. way. Did, the, did YouTube send anything to the company notifying it why its accounts have been canceled? I don't know because I was not privy to those documents. Okay, that's fine. Um, the other thing that happened to you in InfoWars is that it lost its Twitter page, right? Yes. And I believe it's Facebook page? Yes. Okay. And that's what you mean by deplatforming, right? That and a few other platforms. So that's it, that's what we're talking about. InfoWars lost a few platforms. Didn't get denied access to the internet. Doesn't, it's not banned from all social media. You'd agree with that? I wouldn't agree with that because we're talking about the audience reach and the platforms it was banned from encompasses most of the audience, most of the internet. Really? You're gonna testify here under oath, Ms. Karpova, that the audience from InfoWars YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook page is greater than Mr. Jones' live show, radio show, Infowars.com, and the banned video archive. That's your testimony under oath today? I don't know how it would compare because I don't have the analytics for that. Okay, in the future I want you to testify that way instead of saying that it would, right? Because what I wanted your personal Objection, Your Honor, to the instructions to the witness. He can ask questions, she can answer. Um, I'll sustain that, but I am going to say that you need to restrict your answers to things that you know Right? Whether you are asked a question as an individual or as a corporate representative, you have those two roles, you have information in each of those roles, it's not helpful to the jury to guess or assume, so you need to only testify about things you know. Do you understand? Okay, thank you. During the time in which you've been employed by InfoWars, both for personal knowledge, let's do it first through your personal knowledge. Actually, scratch that, let's do it backwards and getting prepared to testify for this company, to be its corporate representative, you became aware when preparing for the topic of audience reach that InfoWars has been carried on several cable packages, correct? Yes. Same question about your preparation. You also became aware that InfoWars was carried on shortwave radio, correct? Yes. And that's a worldwide Christian radio, isn't it? I'm not sure what radio that is. Okay, and you know what Genesis Communications Network is, right? Yes. Okay, Genesis Communications Network is a, um, a an entity by which Infowars is broadcast on a bunch of radio stations. Isn't that right? 
I can't speak to the distribution of Genesis Radio Network. So in other words, when you got prepared to testify in this case about audience reach of these videos and broadcasts and things, how far it gets through Genesis Communications Networks, that's not something you can tell the jury about. I don't have that information. When getting prepared, one of the other things that you knew InfoWars was carried on is OTT boxes. Isn't that right? I don't recall that specific uh, topic of research for in preparation. Let me see if this may help you understand because I used an abbreviation. And do you remember in our prior discussions of each other talking about over the top box systems? Boxes that are put on top of a TV and plugged into it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. And InfoWars has been on those, right? At times. Okay, so that's a yes. Correct? During this time period we're talking about? Again, I'm not sure about the time period. Okay. One of the other ways that you're fully aware that I could see InfoWars content is that InfoWars content is republished by a variety of different people. Correct? Yes. In fact, InfoWars programming is what we call free to air, right? Yes. Okay. And when we say free to air, that means that anybody can take one of Mr. Jones's videos in which he advertises his products, and without paying InfoWars a dime, and without signing any kind of agreement, they can broadcast it wherever they want to, correct? Yes. And they frequently do. There are people who do that, right? I don't know how many people do that. I'm not asking you how many. <coughs> the company is aware, and you were aware when getting prepared to talk about audience reach, you were aware that people do, in fact, republish InfoWars content. That's allowed. Yes. Okay. I want to talk to you next, Ms. Karpova, about during that same period of time, 2012, 2018, I want to talk to you about the ways that InfoWars made money, okay? how the business operated. First of all, advertising. Is that something that InfoWars made money off of? Could you be more specific? Sure, I'll give you one example. You know what rev content is, right? Those little click boxes that were for a long time at the bottom of InfoWars web pages? Um, I don't know about them. That's not my specialty. So I, in other words, let me put it this way. In your role as a producer for InfoWars, Right. Um, you do not encounter the advertising modules on the website? Is that what you're saying? Not typically. Okay. And then in terms of the videos, <coughs> in terms of video production, over the course, and let's back up for a second. As a producer, you have produced, you have worked on multiple InfoWars shows, correct? Yes. Okay. One of those would be the Alex Jones show, right? Yes. On the Alex Jones show itself, during the time <coughs> in which you were producing that show, you personally, there was advertising on that show, correct? Could you be more specific on the advertising, the type I, of advertising you're talking about? No, all, really, all I really want to know is, during the entire time of your career, was there ever advertising on InfoWars? Yes. Okay. So, in advertising is one of the ways that InfoWars makes revenue, correct? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Another way that InfoWars makes revenue is the sale of its products. You know what I mean by that? Yes. InfoWars has a website where it runs a store, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, that store sells a variety of different products, right? Yes. One of the types of products that that store sells is uh, an, uh, herbal supplements, right? Yes. In fact, there are a variety of different supplements, some not using herbs, right, but others using elements like iodine? Yes. Okay. There are a variety of different pills that can be purchased on InfoWars that purport to give health benefits. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. There is a variety of materials, would you agree with me, that are geared towards those who are prepping for emergency situations? Yes. That would include, for instance, tubs of prepackaged food, things like that? Yes. Water filtration systems? Yes. Um, AR-15 parts? 
specifically, you personally. Know, I, what may refresh Rebecca memory, do you remember InfoWars selling a branded, engraved InfoWars AR-15 receiver on its website? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I just can't recollect that specifically. Okay. In other words, there are a large variety of products for sale on the InfoWars website. It's not just one kind of product. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. InfoWars also has an Amazon.com store, correct? Uh, I think so. Okay. has an eBay.com store too, doesn't it? I don't have uh, knowledge, any knowledge about eBay okay. account. Um, would you agree with me? I don't know, do you, do you have the knowledge to know? The sale of the products off M4's website, that's the primary method of revenue for the company, right? Off of M4's store, yes. Okay. Ms. Karpova, do you remember, sitting here today, you can verify for me, that on the day of the San Diego, as the news was coming in of the Sandy Hook shooting, InfoWars was broadcasting that day, correct? I believe so, yes. Okay. Ms. Karpova, one of the things that I'm going to bring you right now that I think might be helpful is I am going to bring you what's been previously marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 31. I'd like you to take a look at that. Okay, and we can see here together that what this exhibit contains is dates and titles of episodes, correct? Yes. Okay, and I will represent to you that this exhibit represents what the parties agree are the videos that were either produced in this case or were discovered by the plaintiffs in some capacity. And that these are the videos that we're talking about in this case. So I would like you to keep that up on the stand as a reference guide if you need to look something up. Okay? Because I know it's, it's fair to have the videos in front of you. You'd agree with that? Yes. Okay. I want to ask you first, if you can look on there and do you see a video that was there on that list December 14th, 2012? Yes. Can you tell the jury what the name of that video was? Connecticut School Massacre Looks Like False Flag Says okay. Witnesses. Connecticut School Massacre Looks Like False Flag Says Witnesses. That's what you said? Yes. Let's talk about a false flag. When we talk about something being a false flag, you would agree with me that let's start simple. That that means whatever event it is, is not what it seems. That's the first thing we can agree a false flag means, right? Yes. Okay. And I believe when you came to deposition, you had discussed with me various other examples of what you believe might be false flags throughout history, correct? Yes. Okay. And in fact, Mr. Jones on his show has often claimed that certain events are false flags, hasn't he? Yes. And when I say a false flag, you will agree with me that in the parlance, the, the verbiage, the language, the rhetoric of conspiracy culture, a false flag means that a, an event like a mass shooting, a bombing, a mass casualty event was in some way staged or faked by forces likely involved in either government or powerful figures. Would you agree with that? I don't agree with that statement. Okay, so according to you, a false flag does not necessarily indicate that an event was staged or faked. That's, not, that's what you're saying? Correct. Okay. Uh, at this point, I'd like to show you a little clip from this video. Um, can we go ahead and play PVX 1A? This is a clip from the December 14, 2012 video. Now, I've got people calling in with all sorts of information on this subject, but get a hold of your cousin when she settles down and, and, and get her to talk to us for any other information. We need to know were there any drills that day or the day before? Uh, does she know anything? Did she have anything about other shooters, or was it that she never saw the shooters? Well, I had to ask them if, if it was supposedly to, because they, they have a lot of security at that school. You have to ring a doorbell in order to get into the school. Yeah, of course, and which is another side of that, yeah. 
20 yeah, federal yeah, model yeah. schools. The thing that, that just scared the daylights out of me, I had, I had a call right away, is I asked them, did, did they ever train for this? And my uncle said yes. Within, within this school year, since September, they have trained for incidents like this. Well, that in and of itself isn't the uh, proof of it, but they can use a drill to then bring in a patsy. Uh, well, it could just be a Prozac head. We'll find out. God bless you, sir. I appreciate your call. Stay in contact. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Rob, who says email. Your Honor, I would object under the rule of optional completeness um, to just the video clip being played uh, and ask that the entire segment be played at this point. Your Honor, the, the rule of optional completeness is when the defendant can identify a statement in the offered matter and then identify a specific statement that would make it, you know the rule. So I just object that that's improper. In yeah, so that, that you are free to admit the entire clip, or excuse me, video. In fact, it's already admitted, as you know. And so if your objection is to the playing of just the clip, we handled that in pretrial, and your objection is overruled. My objection, Your Honor, is that if uh, the jury were allowed to watch the entire video at this point, it would be um, it would be apparent that Mr. Jones is... So off. you are free to play the rest of the clip during your time if you would like to. In that clip, we heard Mr. Jones talk about a patsy. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. A patsy is the fake perpetrator of a false flag who takes the fall. Do you agree with that? That's what a patsy is. I wouldn't agree with that specific definition. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I wouldn't agree with that specific definition. Why don't you define for me what a patsy is? Someone who's being used. Being used, okay. So in this case, whoever was being the shooter was being used. Who was he being used by? Are you asking me personally? I'm sure if you know. Who is, who is Adam Lanza being used by? Do you know personally? I don't. And I said, this is the attack. Look, for, people got to find the clips the last two months. I said, they are launching attacks. They're getting ready. I can see them warming up with Obama. They've got a bigger majority in the Congress now in the Senate. They are going to come after our guns. Look for mass shootings. And then magically it happens. They are coming. They are coming. They are coming. They've already taken over health care. The premiums are doubling. They're bankrupting that. They're already shipped GM to China. They are going to gut this country. They're going to shut down the power plants. They're going to bankrupt us. They are re-educating us. Just like you're, we, uh, we were Ukrainians, and they're Russians. They want us bankrupt. They want the counties and the cities bankrupted and federalized. The feds themselves run by globalists. What does my, what does the new magazine say? You can get it by subscribing. You can, uh, you can get 12 issues. Great way. This man wants your guns. And I, I break down here. They're declaring war on the Second Amendment period. They are declaring war on the Second Amendment period. They are coming after our Second Amendment. It is happening. They want to kill America in 2013. That is their goal. That is what they want. They are moving to do it. Send your tips uh, to Real Alex Jones on Twitter. Tell me what you think. Comment in the articles. I'll be reading what you're saying. We'll have more reports uh, Sunday, 4 to 6, and more reports tonight on the Nightly News, 7 o'clock, PrisonPlanet.tv. No, Ms. Carpova, in that clip we saw a magazine, right? Yes. InfoWars published a magazine, correct? Yes. Okay. On the cover of that magazine, who was that? Who was on the cover of the magazine we just saw? I'm not sure which part you're referring to. Mr. Did you see in the video Mr. Jones is holding up a magazine during that clip? Mm -hmm. Who was on the cover? I can't recall right now. Okay. And maybe refresh your memory, that's President Obama? Sure. That's the man who's coming for their guns, right? According to InfoWars? Is that a question you want? Yes. Is that? Yes, that's yes, a question. Absolutely. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. According to InfoWars, Obama was coming for people's guns. Correct? I just don't. I, I'm sorry, I don't. Do you, do you remember what it said? Statement? I'm sorry, can you bring up the video again? Because I'm not sure Ms. Carpova saw this, and I think she needs to say 
can you bring up the video to the end? Hold on, I need a freeze frame on this. Ms. Karpova, I'm going to bring up the video so you can look at the magazine. All right? Because I just asked you if under InfoWars view, Obama was coming for their guns. And my issue is, I'm wondering, is on this video, <coughs> did you see the portion where he held up a magazine with President Obama that said, this man is coming for your guns? Did you see that? I did see that. You did see that? Yes. So according to InfoWars, on the cover of their magazine, and being yelled out by Mr. Jones, Obama is coming for people's guns, correct? That's the picture we're seeing, right? Yes. At the end of this episode, or the end of this clip we just watched, Mr. Jones, did you hear him talking to the viewers and saying, send me your tips? Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. InfoWars solicits tips from viewers through an official tip email address, correct? Yes. Okay. InfoWars frequently uses third-party material that is submitted to the show, correct? Sometimes. Right, and, and Mr. Jones was just encouraging them to do just that, right? Yes. And one thing we can agree on is on the day of the shooting, while we were still learning what was happening up there in Connecticut, Mr. Jones was already theorizing that this was a false flag, correct? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, okay. So let's go forward to December 17th, 2012. It's five days later, after the shooting. Do you see an InfoWars video that was produced on that day? Yes. Can you please read to the jury what that title of that video is? Creepy Illuminati message in Batman movie hints at Sandy Hook school. This is another video that was something you were to prepare on for your corporate deposition in this case, correct? Yes. You would agree with me that when it says um, the Illuminati, in fact, let me just repeat this whole time. Creepy Illuminati message in Batman movie hints at Sandy Hook School. So first question, the Illuminati is, according to InfoWars, a secret organization that exerts power over world affairs. You agree with that? I wouldn't completely agree with that. Why don't you tell us what Illuminati is? A secret organization that has influences over government, media, Hollywood, law. So the Illuminati isn't just a secret organization, it also includes elements of Hollywood and law and all these other things too, is that what you're saying? I'm saying it in this, in specifically in this definition it would refer to this hidden power uh, that exerts influence that is usually has to do with covert signage, um, satanic imagery, things like that. Okay. And in this specific video, the title here, what is being said here is that this Illuminati inserted a coded message into the Batman movie. Correct? Yes. And that Batman movie, I think you understand, from this video came out before San Diego, right? Yes. Okay. So the allegation is, is that a secret world organization or some sort of secret shadowy forces inserted into the Batman movie a secret coded message revealing that that group was going to do something at San Diego. That's what the argument is here, correct? You argue that that's it's hinting at something to do with saying about school. Right. You know what? Um, do you know what I mean when I talk about predictive programming? Yes. Okay. And that's what this is, right? This is a theory or a, a claim that powerful forces 
have to insert into pieces of media information that reveals that they are going to commit mass atrocities or fake events before they actually do them. You understand that that's what predictive programming means? I would disagree with that particular statement. Okay. Folks, if you want to get an idea of what predictive programming is, go take a look at the plot from the pilot episode of The Lone Gunman and its original air date. You might be surprised if you haven't heard this one. Okay, and let me just make sure. We're five days after the shoot. Five days after. And InfoWars has decided to suggest to its audience that the Illuminati has inserted a secret Sandy Hook message into Sandy Hook months before it ever happened. That's what InfoWars is doing here, right? That's what they found, then, yes. That's what they found. So, InfoWars stands behind that. The Illuminati inserted a creepy message into the Batman movie. That's what InfoWars believes? Your Honor, I'll object under the best evidence rule. It's a 14-minute clip, and you can watch it and see what it says. I think that I'm going to overrule that objection, because this question is responding to Ms. Karpova's current statement about what InfoWars free speech systems, I assume, believes today. So that's true, right? You're, you're saying that's what they found. There was a creepy Illuminati message put in the Batman movie, predicting Sandy Hook. Are you asking me as a corporate rep right now? I'm, yeah, I'm asking you because you prepared on these videos and you just testified, yes, that's what they found. Yeah, that's what I'm asking you. You confirmed that. The InfoWars people found and published this video, <coughs> which you believe today shows a creepy Illuminati message in the Batman movie, predicting Sandy Hook before it ever even happened. I disagree with what you just said. Okay, so, but they did, the InfoWars reporters at least, they found that. At the time, that's what they found, and that's the video. And made. that's what they put out to their audience five days after Sandy Hook, correct? Correct. Do you see a video that took place two days later, on December 19th, 2012? Yes. And you would agree with me that that episode was called Sandy Hook Second Shooter Cover-Up. Correct? Yes. Now, let me see if, I, if we agree on this. I don't know if we do. But I feel like we should both be able to agree right now there was no second shooter. Correct? I, I wasn't there. You've been at InfoWars since 2015. Oh, yes. You've been exposed to all the Sandy Hook stuff since then. You've been a producer, right? Yes. And you're going to tell me you don't have enough information sitting here today to be able to look at that jury and tell them confidently there was no second shooter. That's what I'm asking. Your Honor, I'm going to object to this as argumentative. She's here to testify to her personal knowledge of things. Uh, this question's wholly inappropriate. I'm a little confused as to how, how who, <laughs> are you asking her personally? Is she confident that there was Yes, no now there's a personal question based on her last she can answer that question. years of InfoWars. She can answer that. Based on that experience, that's what I'm asking. Can you answer? Her years of experience as a producer at InfoWars. Yes, Involved she in can answer that question. Since the new information has come up, it appears there was not a second shooter. What new information are you talking about? The years that you're referring to. Yeah, so from 2015 to, to now. <coughs> There was apparently a piece of new information which made it clear to you there was no second shooter. What new information was that? Uh, things aren't clear to me. I'm just telling you the best I can from, okay, and I'm, from I'm, I'm the just very gonna, little coverage that we have done. I'm just going to try to revisit back to so make sure I understand your testimony because I believe that you testified to me that now you can agree there was no second shooter. And the reason you can do that is based on new information. Am I right or am I wrong about that? Again, um, I'm saying I wasn't there. Um, I can infer things. So now let's talk about this December 19th video. It was seven days after the shooting, right? Yes. And already, seven days after the shooting, InfoWars is telling its audience that there was a second shooter cover-up, correct? That's what they believed at the time. That's what they were telling their audience, right? 
Now, are you going to testify for me under oath that you have personal knowledge that the people who created this video on December 19th, 2012, believed it? Are you going to testify to that under oath? Calls for speculation. Shh. Are you going to testify to that? Uh, uh, hang on. No, it does not. Does she have personal knowledge that they believed it? She might, she might not. Overruled. Understood. Uh, yes. Okay, so you know personally who produced this, right? I don't. But you're going to tell us you have personal knowledge that whoever it was knew it was true or believed it was true? That's how we do things. We report on things we believe. In all my experience at InfoWars. Okay. So this is just your inference based on how you think InfoWars operates. Is that correct? Yes. Let's move forward a couple days. December 21st, 2012. Now, we're, days. we're now just a couple weeks after this year. And you'll agree with me on that date, InfoWars published a video called Part of Gotham Renamed Sandy Hook in Dark Knight Film. Correct? Lower, lower part of Gotham. Okay, yes, sir. Lower part of Gotham. Renamed Sandy Hook in Dark Knight Film. That's its title? Yes. This is, again, talking about the coded Illuminati message in the Batman movie, right? Mm, yes. <clears throat> Again, just a matter of weeks after the shooting, correct? Yes. Let's go just past Christmas. New Year turns over, and it's January 10th. It's been just less than a month since the shooting. On January 10th, 2013, InfoWars produced a video that day, correct? Yes. And that video was entitled, Professor Claims Sandy Hook Massacre MSM Misinformation, right? Yes. The MSM, that means mainstream media, right? Yes. And InfoWars likes to view itself as opposed to big, like a CNN, right? Or a, or a, a MSNBC, right? Yes. And it was here that a professor was brought on to claim that the public was being given misinformation about Sandy Hook, correct? Yes. That professor is Professor James Tracy, isn't he? I believe so. And he was interviewed about his claims about crisis actors, wasn't he? Yes. Mm -hmm. A crisis actor, you would agree with me, has two different meanings, right? Would you agree with that? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Let's check them out. Okay, so would you first agree that for many years there have been organizations where they will have actors who will help participate in a crisis drill where if there was, say, like a, a, a police officers who are training for a mass crisis and they need to learn how to put on the tourniquets, there are people you can pay to be actors in that crisis to help them train. You understand that that's a thing? Yes. You also understand that in the conspiracy world, that when someone says crisis actor, that can also mean that a, that a person is being paid to play a role in a faked event. You understand that, right? I don't know if they're being paid. Yeah. Sure, they might do it for free, won't they? Could be a lot of reasons they could do it. I'm not sure. Sure, but let's go ahead and make it some. Hmm. A crisis actor is someone who is in a fake event pretending to be something they're not. Correct? Yes. And InfoWars, less than a month after the shooting, was already recruiting people like Mr. Tracy to come on the show and have him on to talk about crisis actors. You agree about that? I would disagree with that. Okay. And is your problem with the word recruit? Yes. Okay. Mr. Let's just make this part the safe, simple part. InfoWars asked. Dr. You know, James Tracy to come on the show, right? I'm not sure if he was asked or he wanted to come on the show. He sure. Okay. Okay. okay, so one of two things happened. Either either James Tracy got a hold of InfoWars and said, I want to be on the show, and InfoWars took a look at him and what he was saying and said, sounds good, or InfoWars went to James Tracy and said, hey, we've seen what you're saying. We want you on the show. One of those two things is probably what happened. Right? Yes. And that was... 
less than a month from the shooting, that InfoWars was actively promoting the idea on its show that crisis actors were used at Sandy Hook. Do you agree with that? I don't agree with that. I think InfoWars was, ga was gathering evidence that they could find, whether it was for it being uh, some sort of event where government was involved and also was looking for the opposite evidence. Okay. It was just gathering information. Let's move forward five days. January 15th, 2013. InfoWars published a video entitled Sandy Hook AR-15 hoax, question mark? Still no school surveillance footage, correct? Yes. Okay. Let's move forward just another week or so to January 27th, 2013. InfoWars published a video at that point called Why People Think Sandy Hook is a Hoax, correct? Yes. Ms. Karpova, I would like to hand you what's been marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 48. If you remember seeing this email in your deposition, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, this email relates to the events of this case. Do you would agree with me with that? Yes. Concerned Sandy Hook. Yes. And a parent's complaint. Correct? Yes. Your Honor, at this time we move to admit plaintiff's 48. Any objection? Uh, your Honor, the, the bottom half of the email contains a hearsay statement from... Okay, that's, that's all you have to say. All right, so hearsay objection to the second half? To the, to the let's say, the original, okay. sorry, to the original message that's been... All right. And your response is that it's not offered for... Not offered for the truth. Those facts are already established. It's offered to show notice to InfoWars that it goes to their actual knowledge. Okay. So I'm going to overrule the objection. Plaintiff's 48 is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Karpov, you have a copy of 48 in front of you, don't you? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to publish 48 to the jury. All right. We see an email here from a gentleman whose inbox says Lynn Posner, and his signature sign says Lenny Posner. You're aware that Lenny Posner is the father of Noah Posner, a victim of Sandy Hook. Yes. In fact, you've done research regarding Lenny Posner, you personally. Personally, have not. Okay, well, then maybe that's for the purposes of your corporate deposition, you fulfilling that role did research on Lenny Posner. Mm, yes. Okay. One of the things that you know about Lenny Posner is that he was upset with the way Enforcer was covering this story. You know that, right? Yes. Okay. I want to read you this email here, and this is written to writers at InfoWars.com, and Mr. Posner writes to Alex, and he says, Alex, I'm very disappointed to see how many people are directing more anger at families that lost their children in Newtown, accusing us of being actors? Haven't we had our share of state pain and suffering? All these accusations of government involvement, false flag terror, new world order, etc., I used to enjoy listening to your shows prior to 12, 14, 12. Now I feel that your type of show has created these hateful people and they need to be reeled in. Lenny Posner. I read that correctly? Yes. All right, I'd like to show you the response. Can you zoom that up for me? It's from Paul Watson. You know Mr. Watson? Yes, I do. Editor at Enforce. Yes. You would agree with me that over the years, Mr. Watson did not like what other people at InfoWars were doing as it concerned itself. Do you agree with that? Correct. Mr. Watson wrote back to Mr. Posner, and he said, Sir, we have not promoted the actor's thing. Let's start there. You would agree with me that just days before this, InfoWars had Professor Tracy on to promote the actor's thing. You would agree with that? Promoted, I would say speculating. Okay. Looking for answers. And Mr. Watson then says, in fact, we have actively distanced ourselves from it. That's not true, is it? I'm not sure who's Paul Watson speaking for here. Sure, but I don't care who you're speaking for. It's not true, is what I'm saying. When he says we, I, I, you assume, we can assume he means info wars, right? You know that. And it's not true, is it? InfoWars hadn't actively distanced itself 
from the actor's thing. Quite the opposite. Correct? Well, I think Alex was looking for answers. Object. Say. Object on response. It's sustained. Ms. Carpova, what I'm asking you is when you bring on to promote to an audience of millions, when Enforce brings a person on whose theory is that the parents are crisis actors, that's not actively distancing yourself from the actor's thing, is it? Correct. Let's talk about March 27th, 2013, just a little bit further. Are you moving off of this exhibit? I am. Yes, we can take that down. It's 4.58. I think, I think this idea. is a good breaking point for the day. Um, so for my jury, please remember all of my previous instructions, including the um, ban on news um, and discussions and everything else. All right. Um, we will start at 9. I do need my jury to get here by about 8.45 so that we are able to start on time tomorrow. Thank you so much for your excuse for the day. No! You're not gonna fucking enslave me. You're not gonna tell me what I'm gonna fucking do. Fuck this, man. I'm gonna grab his fucking dick. Whoa! Wow! Whoa! Whoa! Whoa. Wow. Reach over and grab me and fucking squeeze me. Uh -huh. I don't like it. I've had Hollywood execs grab my dick three times. It wasn't that big a deal. I'm grabbing Whoa. Stick. Wow. Whoa. Fuck you, man. Whoa. Wow. I'm way fucking smarter than you, and I'm more popular than you. You're not going to fucking touch on people or make people feel uncomfortable. Bunch of fucking pussies, man. You don't have any idea what you're dealing with. That's fucking sick. You ladies get ready to line up and ride Magic Mountain. So, the plaintiff's entire case hinges on whether or not Jones really believed what he was saying or if he purposely lied. And anything else anyone said or did is also Jones's fault as well. But they really haven't proven to me that the video in question was actually edited by an InfoWars employee. It could have come from anywhere. I'm not saying Alex should get a full pass on this, but we're also looking at this whole case through a much more informed modern lens than what we all had available to us at the time of this tragedy. What I mean is, think of all the falsehoods you've seen over the past few years. We've all become a lot more savvy when it comes to fact-checking. And there are people who are employed by official organizations to spread lies through people like Jones. And these days, it's targeted at all of us. Jones dealt with highly and specifically targeted lies long before it reached the rest of us. He fell for it, just as we all have at one time or another. But those who hate him will never be satisfied with the punishment, regardless of how harsh it is. I'm in a bankruptcy hearing, personal and corporate for InfoWars, and the Justice Department is involved and asked me to be, ordered me to be at a hearing today. And they spent probably five minutes of the meeting, that was over three hours long, on my cat. Uh, this is Mushu, my five-year-old daughter named Mushu this two years ago. And they wanted to know if assets were hidden in the cat. The cat was like $2,000. And it is a ragdoll cat, and we really do love it. But they were very serious about the cat and its value, and they may want the cat for the Sandy Hook families. So the deal's broke. You guys aren't getting the cat. So, so this cat is really sweet. My daughter really likes the cat. Uh, he's a little bit tired of me holding him, but I mean, here he is. This is this is this is the terrorist Justice Department hearings with people laughing in the background when they say we want your cat, and they're literally like, "Tell us about your cat." You know, what's your cat's value? They're mad. They don't have these billions of dollars they claimed I did just because they lied. In the media and said I had these things. It's not real, and now they want my cat, ladies and gentlemen. The line in the sand is, you cannot have the cat. I'm sorry. But hey, you can have my First Amendment and my guns, and I support world government. No, actually, you can't have that either. I'll see you. This has been one hell of a long video. I'll be back with another installment as soon as it's ready. But I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go to bed. Thank you. Thanks for watching.